I'll be the villain if that's what you want. <laughs> I'll be the villain if that's what you need. I'll be the villain if that's what you gotta believe. Guys, welcome. It's your favorite villain. It's Pearl. I'm sorry for the delay, guys. I'm so sorry. I, I had volleyball today and I was run I was running from practice, you know, had to shower just to put on a great show for you today. Now, you know, I piss off a lot of people on X and I don't know why, I'm always, I'm such a friendly gal. I have this professional boxer tweeting at me, I forgot his name, Ryan something. I've triggered all the simps at the Daily Wire, obviously there was, I, I found out about this today, there was some show that wanted me to call in to, and he said, this guy has beef with you. And I didn't even know who he was. They said he's like a baseball guy for the Daily Wire. And I thought to myself, <laughs> the Daily Wire has a sports division? <laughs> Someone covers sports? <laughs> Why have I never heard of this? <laughs> and so there's something about me that just, I guess, triggers people. I trigger simps, old ladies that want to look hot, unhappy wives, and 304s. That just seems to be the demographic that, that triggers people. I don't know what it is. I don't know why. But, you know, they, they make Pearl the bad guy. And I'll tell you why, guys. Gynocentrism goes back a thousand years. Now, what is gynocentrism? It's essentially the de deference to women. So going to the authority of women. Now, a thousand years ago, none of this was normal. You know, it, it actually predates, um, it really goes back to chivalry. That is the OG feminism. You know, a lot of people say chivalry is dead. I don't think chivalry should have began to begin with. So basically a thousand years ago, it was arranged marriages. So when they say go back to traditionalism, it doesn't really make sense because it's like what time period? A thousand years ago, the families got together. They said, hey, you two are gonna get together. And then, you know, the families would get together, they'd get on their lot, whatever. They'd live happily ever after. Romantic chivalry, I forgot his name. I'm gonna go over it next week, but there was basically a guy, he was the OG simp. And he was the one who started romantic love. So love based on feelings, emotions, which obviously, you know, men can kind of do that, right? Because they can kind of override their feelings and emotions and say, you know what? I committed to that woman. But, you know, you give women a say in this romantic chivalry. That's when it all went to hell. That's when it all went to shit. And so a lot of this stuff is so old that the person that calls it out is the bad guy, is the villain. The person that says, you know what? No. Statistically, women are not more nurturing than men. Statistically, women are not more. Oh, statistically, women are more violent than men. All of this stuff, because for a thousand years, we've been peddling this stuff. It, you know, and it all started, you know, they, they basically put all of this stuff in the writings, not the, the violence and that, but romantic, like love based on feelings and not practicality. They put it into plays, they put it into writings. And so it's, it's really bigger than me, but I'm the bad guy. Now guys, look at, so I just met with YouTube today and I don't think I'm ever getting back in this partner program because they told me basically this time around, they finally told me what got me demonetized. Um, why I couldn't get back in. What was the title they told us? Blessing. What was it? It was it was most women, something about voting. Something women. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I should. Can am I allowed to say it, yeah, YouTube? Yeah, can, yeah, can I say, say it? it? Let's not say can it. Can I that. say what I said? Can we do that on the website? Sign up, guys. <laughs> 9 99 Yeah. If you guys, it's only 10 bucks a month. And what I'd really like to do is I'd like to get other creators that have been banned off of everything on the website. That, that would be like a long-term goal of mine. I really want this to be a place, you know, it's not like, you know, the Daily Wire where we're going to get rid of someone because they disagree with me. I, I don't care. 
it's not, I, I, I think it's even okay to sign people that maybe have differing opinions so you can, you can have a good debate. Why not? Let's debate. If your ideas are good, let's, let's go at it. So if you can, try to get the yearly membership. That stuff really, really helps us. You'll also have first access to our documentaries. Um, and I want to do it some, somehow. I want to incorporate some of the courses we're going to launch. Troy is going to do a dating course. Um, um, I, I recently am trying to work with Terrence Pop. I know he's got some courses on how to get get your kids in court, like that sort of thing. So I, I don't know how I'm going to incorporate it, but I'd like to get either like a discount or something with it. So, you know, if you guys want to support, it really helps us out here. We want to get a warehouse at some point too. Um, <laughs> so anyways. Okay, so today's story. Um, today we're going to be talking about Brett Cooper again. Now, I'd like to preface, this actually is a stream I hope to help Brett in her future endeavors. I hope she watches this, and I hope that, my hope is that I can bring awareness to some of these issues so women and men can better report on this stuff in the future. Now, some of my opinions have changed over time. There was a time where I probably wouldn't have picked this up. I probably wouldn't have noticed the patterns, but, you know, I, I started working on a divorce documentary. And in the process of working on this divorce documentary, I know it's taking me forever, guys, but it's going to be good. So I need your patience. Um, but in the, which is also going to be on the website, www.theaudacitynetwork.com. <laughs> um, anyways, so basically I, I interviewed guys that were just completely screwed by the system where they had a bitter ex-wife um, that would alienate them from their children. And I would find the same patterns of behavior. I, I would just notice um, the same sort of patterns. And I kind of want to go, I, I can I can go up there, right? Okay, I'm going to go up there first today. I, I want to go through some of the patterns that, can you guys hear me? Can you put the chat over there? I want to go through first, because I'm going to react to Brett's video. Brett basically, Brett Cooper had a video talking about a deadbeat dad. Okay, so she, sorry, I forgot to take this out from last show. P please forgive my, forgive me, okay. So Brett Cooper had a video where she was covering the breakdancing dad. I'm going to show it to you guys in a minute. But essentially, there was a girl that went on TikTok and said that she had a deadbeat dad where her dad wouldn't pay for stuff and essentially just wasn't around for her childhood. So here is the girl. Boom. So I noticed this pattern where women especially, men not as much, but women especially, there's a mother and there's a father. And I noticed this through the divorce documentary. Um, so they were first in love. A lot of times what happens is they're first in love and then boom. Oh no, they break up now for whatever reason, men can go through breakups and not hate the woman. They can kind of just get over it. So he's smiling. He's like, you know what? This is Bob. Let's just say it didn't work out, but let's just be good, you know, let's just be happy. Now the woman on the other hand, how do we handle breakups, blessing? Okay, that wasn't the answer I was looking for. <laughs> okay, okay, how do we, all right, <laughs> all right, not that one. How do we handle, you know, how do we speak about our exes? Do we? Yeah, now, do the men typically trash their exes the same way? Yeah, so this is what I noticed. Now, I spoke to divorce attorneys, and the general consensus is nine out of ten times the woman does this and not the man. So this is the first step the woman does. So first, and she often does this before, before the marriage ends, okay? What she'll do is she'll trash the father. Now, oftentimes, 
She will spread rumors at school, maybe, to their mutual friends. So just imagine I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the, the couple is together, and obviously the wife is kind of bitter, and, you know, the husband's happy, and then they go hang out with some pals. There's, like, this couple, a bunch of pals over here. And so what the woman does is the woman starts talking bad. So maybe she drops the kid off at school and tells all the moms at school that he is evil, abusive, and terrible. Now, oftentimes, these stories lack complete context. So oftentimes what they'll do, and now, is this always intentional? A lot of the times, yeah, but I don't think it always is. Sometimes I think women get so emotional, you know, they just get so mad and they only, you know, we're so narcissistic now, we only see our point of view, right? So she might say, okay, like one time I, I interviewed her, I was speaking to a woman, and she told me that her ex was a bum, right? She said, my ex, and, I, and so I, I just asked, and this is what you guys got to learn to do, ask questions. So I said, did he have a job? Yeah. So how was he a bum? Did he not, did he pay for like the bills? Yeah, but only half. Okay, so he wasn't a bum. <laughs> okay, um, another girl, you know, she, she said, my ex pushed me down the stairs and I thought, Okay, yeah, well, you know, and you always have to ask this question, like, why did he do that? You know, it's not like, you know, I see Blessing every day, right? Hi, Blessing. And you've never pushed me down the stairs, right, Blessing? Nah. <laughs> and so typically, you know, it's not like women are these sweet little angels that just do nothing and don't, you know, contribute to the situation. Now, sometimes I don't think it's intentional. Sometimes I think women, you know, we just see our point of view, whatever. But anyway, so when she's chatting to her friends, and all, we'll get to the daughter later. When she's chatting to her friends, she'll only say one side of the story, you know. Uh, another thing, for example, as another one I've heard is, my father wasn't around. So the daughter will say, my dad just, he wasn't around at all. He was, he was gone. He, he was, ah, the worst. And then do you know what I would find out? I'd say, well, what was he doing? Working. What? You don't want the father to provide? <laughs> so he was doing what he was supposed to do. And then oftentimes the mothers, because they're evil, not all, not all, not all, but, you know, they're evil. So they, what they'll do is they'll say, well, that's not an excuse working to not be there. Anyways, um, another one I've heard is the women will... They'll say, oh, back to the pushing down the stairs. So the women said, oh, I got pushed down the stairs. And so I said, what happened, you know? And she said, well, he wanted me to leave. And so I was like, wait, so he told you to, like, where were you? Well, his house. And we were in front of his daughter. Like, I got that out of her somehow. And I just thought, so you were trespassing? I mean, you know, blessing. If I want you to leave, you know, I... I, and you refuse to leave. I ref you reserve the right to push you, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just I I think Blessing's a pretty cool guy. You wouldn't do me like that, right? Nah. <laughs> you would if, if I said get out, you'd go, right? I I will uh, the? moonwalk out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know, the, whatever. So, whatever. So, anyway, so the mother will chat 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 to all these people. So she might do this like two to three years in advance. So then, okay, she goes, maybe she chats to the wrong person, and then she goes to a, and it could be a school counselor, a lawyer. Um, sometimes it's even a doctor, right? And they say, oh, no, you've been, and by the way, what they also do is they change the definition of abuse. So there's abuse. Now, when, now abuse used to be if Blessing came over and punched me. That would be abuse, right, Blessing? Yeah. <laughs> but now women has changed abuse to behaviors we don't like. So now this has included 
emotional abuse, um, financial, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that in family court, they've switched it. So it used to be one person's hitting the other, un- you know, unreciprocated, whatever. Now they've switched it to emotional abuse, financial abuse, coercive control. They've added all these words that just to confuse you, they don't mean anything. Anyway, so they go to, a lot of times they'll go to a women's shelter, a lawyer, whatever, and they'll give them a story to tell everybody. So, you know, you know, blessings from Zimbabwe. So they might say the men in Zimbabwe are, I don't, I don't know what the, coercively controlling or whatever. Okay, it doesn't matter. They'll, they'll come up with some story. It might fit the culture. So anyway, so now oftentimes the next thing is they bring, they're building a case against the guy. So they'll put clips to social media. Now we saw this in the Crowder case, you know, and oftentimes there, it's like, imagine, imagine if I hit blessing 10 times and then he hit me back once. All right. Now you would never do that. Right. Blessing. Nah, and and hell, what? we just got a fifty dollar super chat on the website. Oh, thank you. From Tim Timoid M of Engel. <laughs> Timoid, thank you so much. Now, now, oftentimes, when you know women post clips to the internet for two two reasons: one, they're emotional and mad, and like you know whatever you know. But sometimes, it's to run a story, right? So it's. You know, it's to build a case against the guy for this. Okay, so if if I hit blessing 10 times and then I cut that off and then the one time he punched me in the face, I put that on social media, well, everybody would call me a poor abused soul. Right, blessing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be I, done. <laughs> yeah, don't do that, okay? <laughs> I won't actually, but you guys get the point. So we get, we trash, they trash the father with rumors. They go around. Um, they go to the counselor, the lawyer. They claim abuse, clips to social media. Um, they might even go to his job, his repute, like take the clips, bring it to his job, whatever. And then five, um, oh, Use kid as a pawn and ruin the reputation with the kid. Now, what I found in my, in my line of work is that typically the father just wants to get along and raise the kid together, where the mother typically tends to want to ruin the relationship so they would have a happy relationship, you know happy relationship between these two and the mother says no no now the problem is mothers get custody 90 percent of the time they get child support they get alimony so they're paid and and this is all based on how much the dad can see the kid so if you're a mom and you're not trying to work too much and you get an extra i don't know two grand a month to not let the dad see the kid Well, what are you going to do? Maybe you just like your kid. You want to see it. But other times it's just because, you know, she hates the dad. So a lot of times the mother's hatred for the father is greater than her love for the child. And I really, I, anybody that doesn't like their dad, please, I am begging you, get his side of the story. And we're going to show you why this show. Women lie. Now, knowing that the mother has the kid 90% of the time, 80%, maybe every other weekend, what does that mean, guys? She can be in her ear constantly. Constantly. How is the father supposed to compete with, you know, the mom can tell 10 stories for two weeks straight And then the father maybe gets every other weekend to clear his name. How is he going to do that? I mean, that's a tough one. I see what you guys do to me. And by the way, by the way, 
you'll notice that women use the same reputation destruction in the media. There's many ways that women do this, okay? Um, yeah, there's many ways. Uh, but basically, that's it. So typically, what I have found, oh, and six, they'll play the, the poor single mother card. Then they'll go get attention and fame and say, oh, my life is so hard because I'm a single mother, even though it was my choice. And a lot of times, too, if the women get divorced, you got to ask them why they got divorced. You have to ask the dad because a lot of times the woman doesn't tell the other side of the story. Okay, I'm looking at the chat. Um, Edward Wilson. Okay, well... Alpha, all right, we're going back to here. So now, how does that how does that lead me? Ugh. Hello, over here. Um, how does that lead me to today? Oh my gosh, this cord is no. Sorry, guys. The what the. <laughs> I told you I'm not a cord person. <laughs> okay, we, we're back. I undid it. Ugh. All right. So, now, remember, Brett, I'm hoping Brett watches this. I'm hoping this can help her. Um, remember, Brett, divorce lawyers say this happens 90% of the time with the mother. So the mothers typically do this. So that means if something like this happens, there is a 90% chance that it, that's what's happening. So notice her coverage on this. It's a gynocentric leaning because, again, we have been told for a thousand years that women are the innocent ones. Women are the nonviolent ones. Women are the ones better with the children. If a woman cries... She probably lies. <laughs> That's what it should be, anyways. Um, okay. Let's pull this up. Mm. I can't hear it. No, the. Okay. Now again, again. I'm hoping my my whole hope with this is to bring awareness to child and parental alienation so people can wake up. It is the saddest thing when people hate their dads for no reason, okay? That, that is my whole aim with this. Welcome back to the comment section. I'm Brett Cooper. So one of the core types of comedy of humor is irony. And sometimes the internet delivers the best examples of this. And if you watch the show regularly, you know that oh, we talk about- Oh, and by the way, Brett, they're trying to use people like me and people like you, the women, to show the whiteboard again. Show the whiteboard one second. They're trying to use us to do this, right? So women, they know that they, if they, they're the damsel in distress, yada, yada, they know that like we'll pick it up. And at one point, I probably would have had the same take until I figured out the truth. Okay, go back. There are so many things in the real world right now that are so incredibly ironic. I was literally saying this in an episode yesterday, but I think that reality is far more funny than anything that TV has produced in years. Like watching things unfold online is just so much more entertaining at this point. And while what we're about to talk about is funny, it can also explain a lot about young women and feminism today. So before we get into it, make sure that you like this video, subscribe to the channel if you've not already, and ring that notification bell so that you never miss a comment section or one of our live streams. All right, so a few months ago, a video went viral on TikTok and on Twitter of a girl sharing a story time of a date that she had just had, and she quickly became coined the factory reset girl. Because in this video, she claims that she's a feminist, she's, you know, bisexual, she's dated girls, she's dated like softer guy. Okay, so that's red flag number one. So just just so you know, Brett, when you um have a chick that's super liberal, it usually means a weak father who wasn't holding frame in the relationship and a strong influence from the mother. Okay. Is and then or a single mother, like either or. She randomly went on a date with a Chad. 
a dude's dude, a bro's bro, the broest of the bros. And she said that the feminism left her body. Let's watch. I went on a date this week and I felt the feminism leaving my body. I live on the east side of LA and if you don't know what that means, it's sort of like the artsier part of LA, you know? It's, it's people say it's like Brooklyn and New York. It is so hipster, I cannot even tell you. Like that is the most hipster part of LA. It's the rich artists that hate that they have money so they live in this area so that they can be like cool and kind of cosplay as poor because oh i'm hipster i live in like sylvan park i live in this part yeah no you are so rich you live in la you have a really nice loft apartment you just <laughs> don't want to live in beverly hills that's the kind of people there okay go on dates with a lot of men and women who you know live over here there's always a negotiation about who pays and that's great i like to pay for people all that but what i will say Say is that I sort of fell into going on a date with the most guys guy I've ever been on a date with. And he's from West West, you know, Santa Monica. He's a bro, right? A guys guy is usually not my type. Like, I cannot remember the last time that I went on a date with like a straight bros bro. You know what I'm saying? But it befell me. It befell me in an organic fashion. Mm, organic fashion, almost like you're biologically inclined to like that. <laughs> That if you just let your guard down, that actually might be what women are interested in? Great. They're not interested in that, so that's wrong. If women rewarded chivalry, men would do it more. And, and that's the thing. Women do not reward the nice guys. Let me just... I'm on this date with this guy, and the thing about a guy's guy is he's putting his card down. He's paying for everything, and I really... Just, it sort of activated something feral in me. I'm not gonna lie. He went to like another bar and he went, he was gonna go to the bathroom. So I was getting prepared to pay for our drinks because he's been paying all night. Of course, I'm gonna pay for the next round. But as he's going to leave for the bathroom, he turns to me and he hands me his credit card. And he goes, okay, we don't care. No. Blah, blah, blah. But the bar is literally, oh, dear okay. God, I'm interested. It's wild. Somebody commented and said, ha ha, I love okay. it. Okay. It's massive. Okay, it's Sorry, I just, I don't, I don't care about the, the date. We're going to keep going. All right, feminism, okay. I mean, want men to actually act like men. Ugh, crazy. Oh, now, this girl is a that. comedian, and based on the TikToks that I'm she going. has posted since December, which is when that video came out and went viral, she has definitely not become some kind of hyper-feminine trad con. Like, in the caption of that video, she was like, guys, don't worry. I checked his politics before going out. I'm not going to become some conservative. He's not conservative. He's just like a guy's guy. Oh, before hooking up with him. <laughs> We do see a lot of truth through humor, which is why I love this story. And obviously, this man and this date stood out to her. And apparently, according to videos posted last week, they are still going out. She's continued to date him. She's continued oh. to talk about him. She talks about this guy's guy all the time. And every one of the videos about him is like, is this how masculine guy okay. acting on all? Okay. It's not wrong to like being taken, okay. being a guy's guy. And dad a there we go recently Thank until you. not you. to be posted this article yesterday you, and they said this girl's dad abandoned his wife and four kids to pursue break dancing and doesn't she look familiar it's the same girl read that headline again this girl's dad abandoned his wife and four kids to pursue break dancing and guys this story is insane she posted it on tiktok she did a whole story time about it we just have to watch What's a piece of trauma that you have that's funny? It has to actually be funny. I'll go first. My dad abandoned my family when I was five years old. That is um, a wife and four kids. He abandoned us and then pursued amateur breakdancing. And he got- So let's just think about that. Uh, does that sound real? Okay, well really good <laughs> like he like blew up like he became like a d-list celebrity status like viral break dancer he became like the oldest actively competing break dancer in the world and he got on good morning america and talk shows and washington post wrote about him and he went super viral and he did all these interviews and he danced with paula abdul and here i'll show you let's see take a look at this 60 year old break dancer yes 60 years i mean it's impressive in Philadelphia and he may not have won but he I tell you what he is winning over a lot of people on the internet yes. he really is yeah. yep. he's winning a lot of people on the internet this guy wouldn't pay my medical bills now we just gotta we gotta think critically here does he look like I mean if we google you'll see his face in a little bit but does he look like a deadbeat does, does that what he looks like I 
The worst part, damn it. He yeah, the biggest thing they say you can't read a book by its cover. You certainly can tell a lot by a cover. Let me, that is the worst advice anyone's ever told me in my life. He should not be able to move his body like that. It's like impossible. It's beautiful. Hey, dad. Like there was no split custody or anything. Like he just like left. So that's red flag number three. There was no split custody. Why? She didn't see him. Why? Okay, why? Th these are the questions we got to ask. Kids to do that. You may not have paid for some of my medical bills growing up. Oh my God, I just, she's wearing one of his. Now this, if it was a divorce with a D, that means 90% of the time, the woman gets alimony and child support. And they get a good percentage of the marital assets. So again, that two plus, like, if you don't know what to look for, you, would, you wouldn't know. But my hope is that this helps other reporters report this better in the future. <laughs> oh my God, I just noticed it. Because again, you know, if you look at the, I'd have to go back, but I don't want to lose my time. The, the thumbnail, it said deadbeat dad. So again, th that's engaging in the same reputation destruction, right? breakdancing merchandise so that's him he's on his head benny hana is his b-boy name because his name is ben hart you know i'll get texts like this happy birthday you know and then this is the second question you know real deadbeat dads they don't really want much to do with the kids when they're older either why why would they so if he's texting happy birthday i mean this out this looks like that's so cute it looks like a text my dad would send <laughs> <laughs> you know, so th th this is just kind of what you got to look for. Question mark, and then like links to his to his breakdancing videos. So if you have funny trauma, like actual funny haha -ha trauma, I need to hear it. I mean, that is wild. That objectively is very funny. Now I know that she did include some videos of his breakdancing, but this one just made me laugh so hard. This was in a random comment section. This is him in 2019. Yeah. So again, back to the does this look like a deadbeat? And the thing is like. We got to offer corrections, especially, you know, we're, we're bound to get this wrong. But again, that's like a, a terrible thing to say, you know, it's the same reason I keep asking Candace Owens to retract what she said about Crowder. I don't think she ever will, but it, it's like, you know, in front of the White House. Oh, there he goes. Yep. That is her father. What a man. I'm just imagining him like setting up the camera and it's just making me cringe so hard. You know, I think as he's aged a little bit, he's lost, <laughs> he's lost some of the talent. I think he peaked very quickly and then lost it because that basically just looked like a cockroach running around. Now, somebody said all the news stories calling him the breakdancing dad when he was a total deadbeat. Peak, peak. I mean, would you expect anything less from our culture? Like seriously? See, this is the same thing. Yeah. Girl says story, we just believe, right? I mean, it's no surprise because this is the same culture where 70% of women who get abortions say that they did it because they felt pressured or cool. Oh, no, dear God. Brett, you got to stop believing these chicks. Uh, women get abortions because they want to. Men have zero say in abortion. And they also have, can Google what an abortion is. It's not hard to find. If Google doesn't put it up, you, you can go to other websites. Mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, 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 no. By their partner. And that is where preborn steps in. Okay. Da, 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 hear her da, 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 da. Preborn. Don't, don't care. Don't care. Don't care. Don't care. What makes you think that they're going to stay and not walk out on their kids? And when they are the most preborn.com slash Brett. I mean, if our society does not even value children when they are the most innocent. And, and then we got to ask this question, okay? Who is society? Who controls the culture? Women make 80% of consumer buying decisions. Women are the ones with the kids the most. If the culture is one way, it's because it's catering to women. Even the increased sexuality, that's catering to women. If you look at a men's action film, I mean, yeah, there might be like one 
hot chick in it, like Megan Fox, you know, Transformers. But Transformers wasn't about Megan Fox. It wasn't about the romance. Women watch Fifty Shades of Grey. You know. Most precious. What makes you think that they're going to stay and not walk out on their kids? For freaking breakdancing. Like, none of this is a shocker, sadly. If you look up Ben Hart, it's like the Washington Post article is talking about his family and, you know, being the breakdancing dad. Good Morning America called him the breakdancing dad. Like, everything was about his role as a father. When he was literally not being a father at all. Another person said, imagine leaving your family just to pursue your new hyper fixation for breakdancing. Somebody else said. So and then my question is, you know, he issued the second video. I knew exactly what happened when I watched this. It's been a month where I, did she put out a retraction? I didn't I didn't see it. If she did, let me know in the chat. I didn't this video see about it. meeting a guy's guy and having feminism leave her body in this. There should be a sitcom written about this girl and her life. Like, literally. I don't know if you'll watch this video, girl, but you are a comic. You should write it. And if you don't, I will because it's absolutely fantastic. Now, even though this story is objectively funny and we can all laugh at this, it also breaks my heart because no wonder she was shocked by having a strong, unflappable dude. But see, now, so who would who would Brett be in this? Um, in, do my whiteboard again. No, I don't want smoke, guys. I'm trying to I'm trying to show you guys the patterns. It's not about smoke. Um, you see the the people, the little people there. Um, trash the father with rumors. So you would be the person that she's telling. Go back to me. She would be the person she's telling the rumors to. And I just want to show you guys how it happens. So now she heard the story from the daughter who heard the story from the mother. And then everyone just believes it without asking any questions. We have to ask the follow-up question. Her on a date and do the bare minimum of paying. Like, she's never... Yeah, and again, the bare minimum of paying. You know, women... She's not traditional. Why do traditional women deserve traditional treatment? That's just entitlement. Sure, if you're traditional, you were raised by two parents that are still married. You got married young. You know how to cook. You know how to take care of a household. You, you're, if you're traditional, sure. I wouldn't consider myself traditional. I, I wouldn't consider most women traditional. I can maybe think of five, maybe. So, you know, at that point, it's kind of just entitlement. Had that. Her father doesn't even remember her birthday, apparently. Also, through one of the comment sections onto posts... And this is another thing. So... What they do a lot of times is men and women remember different things about the children. My dad loves me dearly, okay? I look it. And I love my father dearly. But he, that man does not, he, he doesn't always remember my birthday or like the year. If you ask him like little stuff, it's just not, God, women remember little details a lot more than men. You know, so a lot of times what women will do as, you know, proof that the dad isn't a good dad is they'll they'll say things that they are naturally better at. I can't remember the ones that guys are naturally better at. It's like women are better at knowing like the doctors their kids go to, the little details where men. I mean, OK, I'll give you an example with my dad. If you ask my dad what the score was in my fifth grade basketball tournament that he coached me in, <laughs> you know, he might not know my birthday, but he would remember that, you know, <laughs> he'd be, and he would tell me all about it. It's so funny. He'll tell me about overtime. <laughs> but yeah, he probably doesn't remember his own birthday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is the this is the thing. Men and women are just different. They remember different stuff this video and about the story i learned that her father has now moved on from breakdancing he's a little too old to do the head spins and he's now become a crypto guy a right-wing crypto guy like he was even interviewed by dinesh to susan he featured this on his blog and i think this is so and then we gotta we gotta ask ourselves are deadbeat dads usually this responsible generally speaking like it, they they're you know a crypto guy important point because I think a lot of people on the right assume that just because they're conservative or have conservative values, that they will automatically be good parents, that that just inherently makes somebody better. But just being on the right does not... Yeah, and it's the same thing with the women, Brett. I, I mean, look at I, I'm, I'm just being honest when I'm analyzing this stuff. Most And out of the, the trad con women, I, 
you're you're the you're the best by far but 99 percent of them they, they act it, it's the same thing it's like the feminist shame insult guilt need to be it, it's all the you know because we women we just have a default programming our default programming is basically feminism some some are worse some are better but it's you know that you have good values like you're there's no there's no conservative woman in divorce court <laughs> Politics does not inherently make you a better person. This right here, what we're talking about, is not about politics. I do not care. It is about prioritizing your family, putting their well-being above your hyperfixation of the month of breakdancing. Like this father walked out. He abandoned his family. He See again, you're you're saying that as fact. It's not a fact. And look at look, think about this, Brett. 366,000 views. And the problem we're gonna get, the problem. The retraction will never get as many views as the original story. And many men can never recover from this stuff. Never. And, and a lot of times, I just want you to be aware, this is the point where a lot of men commit suicide. A ton. Because the woman has trashed their reputation. A lot of times they, they lose their jobs. A lot of times they're in a bunch of debt. They get thrown in jail. And we're going to watch the follow-up video because it, it, it's perfectly embodying what I'm talking about. This is why I will never, 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 never tell men that marriage is the answer. Because I have seen the other side of it. Now, yeah, so let me keep going. His four kids alone. Like she was four years old when that happened. He left his daughter without a role model, both for her or for the type of man that she would hopefully find and fall in love with. And sadly, I know you guys know this, but this is not a rare occurrence. In 2022, there were 73 million children in America. And of that number, 18 million of them lived without fathers. And this- Why? We gotta think critically here, right? If women are given money to kick the dad out of the home, and to not let the children see the father, what do you think happens? I don't understand why conservatives totally understand this concept when it comes to welfare. If you pay people to be lazy bums, they do it. If you pay women to be lazy bums and deadbeat moms, they'll do it too. The, the, dead, the deadbeat father, it's a myth. And I urge you, I urge anybody that's watching that has a poor relationship with their dad, to ask their dad for their side of the story and just let him talk. Don't interrupt him, give him an hour to just explain himself. Not include the fathers that are just not present or not active in their lives or absent fathers, but are still married. Like that does not include that. That is 25% of American children. Like no wonder we have women growing up resenting men or being Okay. But see, notice, and this is why I say she is a gynocentric and, and it's hard. Everyone pretty much starts with this. It's been a thousand years, but this is a gynocentric leaning because she's automatically deferring to the woman's story, okay? Oh shit, what are they? To hate them or not trust them or just naturally being attracted to women instead of men or softer, less masculine men. Like none of this- So still, you know, and, and Brett, we can't blame female behavior on the men. You know, there's a, there's a girl on my team, actually. She had two sisters and they both grew up in the same household. They both were in a single mother home. Uh, allegedly the dad walked out but who knows and one of them is a single mother and one of them is engaged to be married and I, I actually think they'll make it I rarely bet on people making it but she, she's one of the few and she's actually a really kind sweet person uh, the choices that you make are nobody else's fault they are your fault you can't blame the father you can't blame anything it's it's a character flaw it, you know, men are raised in single mother homes all the time. If they commit a crime, it's still their fault. Should be surprising. Now, obviously, that is not the only cause of feminism, like not by a long shot, but it is certainly a contributing factor. But the good thing is, I have high hopes for this next generation because of you guys. Because I read the comments on all of these videos, I see your DMs, I see the things that you guys send me on TikTok, I see the stories that you share about your children and your marriages and the choices that you're making for their futures. And it's incredible. All children obviously need their mothers, but we cannot forget fathers. And I'm so glad that we have woken up to this reality.
Yeah, okay. No, you haven't. Um, <laughs> sorry. I just, guys, I've seen too much. I've, I've seen too much. So now let's see the dad's side of the story. Let's see the dad's side of the story. And I want you guys to, I'm going to point out some patterns here that I've seen. Um, Blessing, can you, would you mind pulling up my phone over there so I can read the chat on it? Just in a second. But I'm going to play it and then you can grab it. Judge Leslie Alden had just sentenced me to one year in jail for contempt of court as part of my divorce. I knew the instant that I saw Judge Alden's haircut that I was finito, gonzo, he's de wa. Here's what happened. I had allowed my ex-wife to take 97% of the marital assets, which totaled $1.7 million for her. I left myself with $72,000 which was quickly consumed by lawyers. Inexplicably, I had also agreed to give my ex-wife an additional $100,000 in cash above and beyond the marital assets that we had. So my ex-wife was supposed to get $1.8 million, but I was only able to come up with $1.7 million. I was $100,000 short. The reason I was $100,000 short was my ex had destroyed my business by issuing subpoenas and deposition requests to my clients. So it's so crazy. I sort of predicted this before I even saw it. It's the same, same pattern. She thought there was more hidden money and more hidden income out there for her to find. Now, my clients did not want to be part of a nasty divorce litigation. So they ran for the tall grass and ghosted me. My clients were gone and my income was gone. So then my ex and her legal team filed what's called a show cause petition with the court asking for the court to put me in jail for contempt of court for failing to come up with the final $100,000 due. Also, my lawyers quit the case the day before the hearing because I owed them a lot of money. So I went into Judge Alden's courtroom without a lawyer. The next thing you know, I'm buck naked and getting a full body cavity search by police officers in the basement of the Fairfax County, Virginia jail before getting into my prison jumpsuit and chained to 11 other inmates. Okay, let's go back to the beginning and find out how I got into this situation. And I touched on this story in a previous video, but people in the comments of that video are asking for a lot more detail. So here goes, and get ready for a really insane story. Actually, beyond insane. Okay, a lot of you in the comments to my recent videos are asking me questions along these lines. How can you keep such a positive disposition in the face of so much anger, hatred, and poison from your ex-wife to the point that she destroyed your business, had you put in jail, with help from an insane feminist judge named Leslie Alden, also poisoned your daughters against you and continues to try to destroy your livelihood even today, 19 years after your divorce, and even though your ex got remarried in 2012. What might her current husband think of all this? Might this behavior by my ex-wife, his current wife, cause a bit of nervousness on his part? He seems like a very good guy. My advice to him, keep your head on a swivel. And I've linked to these previous videos below. My ex-wife Betsy even wrote two books trashing me and presenting herself as a picture of virtue. The title of one of her books is It Takes a Parent to Raise a Child which is a play off Hillary Clinton's book, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. In Betsy's book, It Takes a Parent to Raise a Child, she presents herself as this heroic single mother who raised four children by herself after the husband, me, supposedly abandoned the family. And the title of this book literally makes no sense. Her second book is a collection of newspaper columns she wrote, largely repeating the same theme. She was also all over TV repeating this theme when she was promoting her books. Betsy Hart didn't exactly write the book on love, but she does. All right, guys. So um, I just logged into the Audacity Network chat. I'm, I'm watching it now. Sorry, guys. Hello, D. Miller. Hello, Miss Ziegler. I apologize. I, I, I don't remember my login to it, so I, have to, I need Blessing to reset it. Um, okay. But so you see the, the patterns, right? Destroying his reputation. She wrote a book. Oftentimes, you know, the book is I am a victim to elicit sympathy. 
and and women we we have to we have to really have a, a strong mind to not let this overtake us it is really easy in this culture you know everyone's you know many times if you say you're the victim nobody second guesses you and, and so you could say something that's half true and all of society will confirm it you know how is she's a single mom and she's getting 97 percent of the marital assets 97 at a nationally syndicated column about it. Betsy went through a divorce and suddenly became a single mother of four. She speaks from experience. Her practical and humorous insights on family issues are often featured on shows like Fox and Friends and other media outlets. Betsy's new book, From the Heart, is a collection of some of her most popular columns. But guess what? So many women in particular, and certainly children, get really um, short-shifted in the process. Boy, they really, really do. You went through a divorce in 2004. I what did. was that like for you? Well, I was devastated. I very much did not want it. It was not my choice. But so It was not my choice. Okay. But again, when women say it wasn't my choice, they never talk about the behavior that often let men don't typically divorce for no reason. Men are kind of, if they get a girl that's, you know, good enough, they're kind of set. They're good. I mean, to them, it's like too much work to divorce. Unless you're just being a miserable bit. Like, Blessing, what would it take you to divorce? No divorce. Never? Oh, no, she, 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 well, she's, she's cheating on you. No, no, she's out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So a lot of times they say it wasn't my choice, but, you know. There I was with four very young children, just Yikes. 10 down to three. And I was sort of thinking, oh, my goodness, what, what do I do now? Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God. And then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. And over those eight years, learned and grew a lot and learned mm -hmm. through adversity and to let my children see me in adversity and not have to pretend, oh, this is all great when it's not, and to let it's them so see that hard. pain. It's isn't it? You know, when you're in the yeah. midst of such deep pain yourself and then you feel so um, like you have to fill the bill for all of your children at a time where this is very devastating for, right. me, for them, too. How did you juggle and all I, of that? I think it's OK to let our children see us when we're broken, because so often God works through the broke. Wrong, 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 wrong. So women often what they'll do is they'll so go back to the board. I see your complaint. D about the marker. We'll we'll get it next show. But you see right there how on the board um, the the tra the trash the fathers with rumors and stuff. Women will use their feelings as an excuse to talk to the kids and let them go back to me. See them see them broken as an excuse to trash the dad. The kids got to know what's going on. The kids will just the. They'll like I, I heard that we had single mothers on our show tell me that it's they the the kid would just know, obviously. It's like Woody. So when we say this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway, that can almost be more powerful, I think, than look at me, I have it all together. Because yeah. one is about God and the other is about me, and I want it to be about God. And then so many of those columns made it into my book from the heart, yeah. and with a lot of more backstory and sort of putting the whole story together, um, about making wise choices in relationships, about asking for what we as women really want. I'm newly engaged, and um, we'll be married this fall. That's very and exciting. After Eight years as a single mom, I'm yeah. very grateful. So that's all in from the heart. Until now, I've been silent through all this. Until my 25-year-old social media influencer daughter posted a series of viral videos trashing me, repeating the same lies she had been told by my ex-wife since our separation and divorce in 2004 and 2005. My dad abandoned my family when I was five years old. That is um, a wife and four kids. He abandoned us and then pursued amateur breakdancing. Let's see, take a look at this 60 year old breakdancer. Yes, 60 years old. That's Ben Hart. He's competing at a breakdancing competition in Philadelphia. This guy wouldn't pay my medical bills. That is not true. This video got 8 million views just on TikTok. 
and tens of millions of views across all social media platforms. So and I'll tell you how the women lie with that. So the women might say to the dad, oh, the kid, you know, has this medical issue. Can you pay for it? And the dad may say, no, I'm giving you a billion dollars a month. Pay for it yourself. <laughs> and that, you know, that's kind of a funny way how women. Then Maddie went up with an even more negative second video. I know my dad posted like a 10 minute video or whatever being like, you know, my daughter's lying. We have a great relationship. I have a great relationship with all my kids. That's just objectively not true. Like, guys, we're all freaking out about this in my family group chat right now. We're being like, he's so unhinged and delusional. We don't know if he actually believes his own narrative or if he's lying on purpose, but he's just like a weird guy. Yeah, he said he lived down the street from us. That's not true. Or like, if he did, it was only for a few months, maybe. But I don't want to get into this. Like, again, like my video was basically like sanitizing the situation and like poking fun at the lightest parts of that childhood trauma. But obviously, in real life it was a lot more like complicated and traumatic and it was really hard he left us immediately married another woman we didn't hear from him for years and then he would visit every few months and we'd go out to dinner but like he truly had no hand in raising us at all some money growing up i like i honestly don't know the nitty-gritty of the financial situation I, I really really don't bottom line is this guy was a completely absent father completely absent father and this story blew up all over the internet in the media her dad apparently became like a D-list celebrity, became the oldest actively competing breakdancer in the world, went on Good Morning America, went super viral, etc., etc. But she added that he wouldn't pay her medical bills. Then comes Ben, stage name Benny Hanna, with a 10 minute reaction video and some pretty good natured corrections. He claimed he lived close by after the divorce, did pay medical bills, child support, put money into a college fund to the tune of around $5 million all in all to cover the cost of the kids, and said he saw his kids often when they were growing up. But he did admit that from his daughter perspective as a five-year-old it might seem like abandonment but that in his opinion it was not a totally accurate account whilst we watch this father-daughter union play out in real time obviously elon musk weighs in to tell ben you're awesome i didn't even know but this has got me thinking ben is getting absolutely dragged online with people calling him a deadbeat dad and like loads of other grim stuff are these internet call outs fair like should we be airing our dirty laundry on tiktok because i've seen these happen time and time again and it always turns out that there's another side to the story now i don't really blame maddie for any of this though she is 25 years old and should know better. And she's just repeating the lies she's been told by her mom for 19 years. Now remember the theme of Betsy's books, newspaper columns, and TV appearances. She presents herself as a single mom who raised four kids by herself, with no help from the dad, who abandoned the family. No help from dad whatsoever, right? What Betsy always fails to mention is I paid her about $4 million over the years in alimony, child support, health insurance, and men view their money as their time. And a lot of women will come back and say, oh, but, but that's not an excuse for you to not be there. No, 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 no. Somebody, <laughs> somebody has to pay for stuff. You know, my dad worked a lot when I was a kid. He worked a lot. And I'll never hold it against him. His whole goal in life was to pay for our college. Thank you, Dad. I have no college debt. Thank you <laughs> for Ganae. <laughs> you know, and, and this is the this is the crazy thing. It, it's like as women, we're told we're always the victim. We're always, 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 always the victim. Life insurance contributed more than six hundred thousand dollars to the kids' college fund. She also fails to mention that I lived a bit more than a mile down the street from the kids in Lagrange, Illinois. Easy walking distance, sidewalks all the way. I saw the kids all the time. So no. I did not abandon the kids at all. Betsy and I got a divorce. About half of marriages in America end in divorce. It's common. And no, Betsy did not raise the kids with no help from the dad, as she's been claiming in her books, TV appearances, and newspaper columns. She also took every legal action possible to prevent me from seeing my kids, including filing a motion to prevent visitation. During our divorce proceedings, Betsy destroyed my business with her subpoenas and deposition requests to my clients. So my clients ran for the tall grass. I then fell short on payments. Betsy and her lawyers then filed a show cause petition with the court, asking that I be put in jail for contempt of court. So that's what happened when I had the misfortune of entering the courtroom of this feminist judge, a woman by the name of Judge Leslie Alden. I knew the instant I saw Judge Leslie Alden's haircut that I was in big trouble. And then when I saw how she looked at me, and by the tone of her questions, I knew I was dead in the water. 
Finito, Gonzo, Histoire. Another theme of the comments in my previous videos is people want to know more about my second wife, Wanda. Wanda and I have been happily married now for 18 years, since December 6th of 2006. No issues whatsoever. We have a fantastic marriage. So a big part of this video will be contrasting my two wives, my ex-wife, Betsy, with my current wife, Wanda. I'll also be talking about how the family law legal system is totally rigged and stacked against dads to the point of absurdity, to the point that it's pretty much financial suicide for males to get married today. My hope with this video and my other videos is to help dads out there who are divorced or who are getting divorced to avoid the many mistakes that I made in my divorce because I made every possible mistake in my divorce that it's possible to make. The good news is my son appears to be unaffected by all this drama. Our and see, that's, the, that's the, the pattern you tend to see. Men can kind of see through bullshit a lot better than women. So the men, when there's a divorce, they kind of want to stay out of it. You, you know, blessing. How many times have you heard a chick talking nonsense and you just didn't say anything? Uh, no. Like, when's the earliest you thought, this girl is full of shit, and you didn't say it? How old were you? Earliest. At eight. Yeah. <laughs> At eight. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, guys from a young age can just pick up bullshit a lot quicker than us. We're kind of dummies, you know? <laughs> even, you know, even in this video, like, none of us even asked any, any questions to verify any of this. Like, a lot of everyone just jumped to the chick's defense. Appears to be fine. I see my son Peter all the time. I met Wanda at a karaoke bar, and what attracted me most to Wanda is her incredible story, far worse than I went through in Judge Leslie Alden's courtroom and eight nights in the Fairfax County Jail. Wanda's background is a story of true grit. Wanda is the opposite of privileged. Now I wish Wanda could sit here next to me while I tell you her background but she doesn't like to go on camera, much less speak publicly on the internet to people she doesn't know. She's sitting in the other room right now watching TV. Maybe I can get her to pop in here later. And it's taken me many years to pull this story out of Wanda. She doesn't like to talk about it because she says many people went through what she did in Laos. She doesn't see her story as anything special. Wanda grew up in Laos, which is right next to Vietnam, across the Mekong River from Thailand. Her Laotian name is Vondalone. Wanda is an Americanized version of her Laotian name. After the communists conquered Laos in 1975, Wanda's mom and oldest sister, Kamsi, put together a plan for the family to escape to Thailand when Wanda was 13 years old. Wanda's story in Escape from the Communists is similar to movies like The Killing Fields and First They Killed My Father. Wanda's deceased mom, Champa, was born in China. When Japan conquered China and was committing genocide, basically killing everyone, the parents of Wanda's future mom put her on a boat when she was about 15 years old with a suitcase full of cash, gold, and other valuables. This was probably in 1943. Wanda's future mom, Champa, ended up in Laos. She never saw her parents again. Wanda's future mom arrived in Laos as a 15-year-old girl not knowing any Laotian, but she built a life there. She met a guy named An, Wanda's future dad, who is very good looking, by the way. Wanda has two younger brothers, two older brothers, and four older sisters. Mom was very industrious. She knew the value of gold. So she started a cash for gold business. Mom also made food products, mostly baked goods, and sold them at the local market. She put the kids to work in this business, including Wanda. Mom also bought a bus and started a bus service. Wanda's father and Wanda's oldest brother, Sakta, would drive the bus, and the bus had a route. People would get on the bus at various stops and go to the market in Pakse. So this was a third profitable business for the family. Wanda's father also worked as a delivery truck driver for the government when the French were running Laos before the communists took over. The driving entrepreneurial force in the family was Wanda's mom. She made enough money with her baked goods, cash for gold business, and shuttle bus business that Wanda's family was able to buy two houses, paid for the houses with cash. There was no such thing as a mortgage in Laos, at least not that they knew about. The house they lived in overlooked the great Mekong River. The other house was for their extended family. So they got to be very well off financially by Laotian standards of that day. 
Then the communists conquered Laos. Okay, guys, I'm going to skip like 10 minutes of this. It is a really great story. I do recommend you watch the whole thing, but it, it doesn't really matter as much to, to the... She, she has a really incredible story. It's really great. But I'm going to... Okay, we're going to go back here. Watching their cargo. Wanda doesn't remember how many there were. She just says it was a big crowd of refugees and gangsters who had guns. Wanda, her mom, the smugglers, and the other refugees walked for four days and three nights through the Laotian jungle. Wanda said they had almost no water or food. She says she thought she was going to die out there. Plus, if they ever got caught by the communists, they would all be shot. No question about that. Wanda says, I was so hungry and thirsty, I had ticks all over my body, including one in my eye. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. After and you have to watch how people tell stories. Is it, is it everything happened to me, always the victim? Or, or is it, you know, like this other chick? Four days of walking, they finally reached the canoes which were hidden along the banks of the Mekong River. They all went across the Mekong River in the canoes in the cover of darkness. I gotta, I gotta, I'm and so, when they got to the other... I'm so sorry. I gotta skip this, guys. You gotta, you, you gotta watch the whole thing. It's just not too relevant to this part. Um, I just want to get the clips of the mom talking. Point. She was wearing sandals and a Laotian dress. Her possessions amounted to one pair of sandals and two dresses. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. Wanda says arriving in America was like landing on another planet. It just looked so different than anything I had seen before, she says. The family was placed in... <laughs> this unhappy. woman is hot. <laughs> Blessing, blessing. Would you? <laughs> Would you? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay, freaking it. Okay. Um, anyways, so we're going to skip over. It's a long video. That's why I kind of have to skip over this part. Um, okay, then she talks about Wanda's sons. She has no fear. Wanda also has two sons from a previous marriage. One is David, who served one tour in Iraq and two tours in Afghanistan. He has amazing stories. Her second son is John. He's also a great guy and a very hard worker. He works as a plumber. We're very proud of them both. Okay, now let's switch to my legal battles with my ex, Betsy. And many of you are asking these questions in the comments to my previous videos. Many of you are asking, why would I give my ex 97% of the family assets at the end of the marriage in 2004, totaling about $1.8 million? and then leave myself with just $72,000, which was quickly consumed by lawyers. And why would I agree to pay my ex $18,000 per month in alimony and support, which was later reduced to $12,000 per month after extensive litigation? And why would I agree to pay child support until each kid turns 22 years old? And these are all very good questions. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more background on my divorce from my ex. Would you guys smash the ex-wife? One in the chat if you would. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> more detail than I've previously provided. My wife and I got separated in 2004. We got divorced in 2005. We'd been married since 1987. We have four children, the oldest being my son, and then three daughters. We lived in Virginia just outside of Washington, D.C., in Fairfax County. I'm not going to go into all the issues that led to our divorce, but one of the big points of friction was different attitudes we had about money. She was a spendaholic, frankly. Now, I grew up in Vermont and was basically a country boy with pretty simple tastes. A big house and big lifestyle were never important to me. I often say you can only live in one room at a time. Why do we need all these rooms? What's even the point of living in a house that's bigger than you need? Warren Buffett has the same belief. He's worth $140 billion. He's the greatest investor of all time. He still lives in his middle-class house in Omaha, Nebraska, that he bought in 1958 for $31,000. I have a similar attitude toward money as Warren Buffett. Why spend more money than you need to spend to have a perfectly comfortable life? I built a successful... There are more ones in the chat than I'm proud of, guys. Uh, 
I'm not. I'm disappointed in some, some of you. Sorry, I'm going to continue. I agree with him, though, on the money thing. Advertising agency. I was making quite a bit of money. When we had Peter, our youngest son, in 1994, we decided that Betsy would be a stay-at-home mom. Betsy actually had an extensive work history. She was working in the Reagan White House when I met her. And I had written speeches for Reagan's 1984 presidential campaign, also for George H.W. Bush's 1988 presidential campaign. And I wrote speeches for many prominent politicians of that era. In fact, my first business was a speech writing business. Someone said men have needs? <laughs> Guys! This chick got him thrown in jail. You'd still go. Th oh my gosh. All right, you know what? <sighs> I'm disappointed, but not surprised. Not surprised at all by you guys. Not even a little bit. This then morphed into an advertising agency because I found that I could make more money writing advertisements. D. Miller gets it. D. Miller gets it. That's the right answer, D. And speeches. The problem with writing speeches is that once the speech is written, the money stops flowing. The only way you can make more money as a speechwriter is to write another speech. So you're basically selling your time for money. With advertising, you charge a creative fee, a fee for writing and creating the ad, plus you earn a royalty, or you earn a percentage of the advertising buy. So you create the ad once, and so long as that ad is being used, so long as that ad is running, you receive a steady stream of income. And I can talk about how I set up my businesses in other videos. So my advertising business is quite successful, but I'm not really motivated by money. I just do what I like to do, which is write and create. The money then just seems to flow in automatically, almost without me thinking about it. And this actually goes to my whole approach on how to succeed in life. And that's to focus on your daily process, your daily routine, not so much on the goal. I believe in process over goals. If you have a good process and a good routine, good things tend to happen. So I've written seven books. The way I set out to write a book is not to think about how difficult it will be to write 300 pages or 400 pages of manuscript. Instead, I set out to write three pages a day. And then after 100 days of doing that, I have a 300-page manuscript. I have a book. The way you run a marathon is one step at a time. Don't think about the 26.2 miles that you have to run to complete the marathon. Just put one foot in front of the other. Just start and then put one foot in front of the other. And keep doing that until the finish line comes in view. If you want to lose 20 pounds, don't think about that goal. Instead, commit to walking three miles a day. And just do that every day, come hell or high water. This becomes part of your daily routine, like brushing your teeth. It becomes part of your life, something that you just do every day. Wanda has a relative in Laos who did this. She walked three miles every day. She lived to be 102. That's pretty much how I approach every area of life. And that's pretty much how I built my ad agency. So when Peter was born in 1994, Betsy wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. And I was happy with that, even though it meant losing one income. And she still did do some professional work. She wrote a weekly column for Scripps Howard News Service, which I think brought in about $1,000 a month. Now, I was perfectly happy in our townhouse. But because my ad agency was doing so well, Betsy wanted to build a big house in a wealthy suburb of Washington, D.C., a suburb called Great Falls, Virginia. We bought two acres of land, very close to the Tyson's Corner shopping mall, and we built a pretty enormous house, six bedrooms, 6,000 square feet, not counting the basement, which was also huge. Zillow currently values that house at $2.5 million, and Betsy was spearheading the house building project. I wasn't paying that much attention to what she was doing on it, but once I saw the scale and scope of it, I was pretty annoyed and pretty stressed out by it. And I'm told our builder had a nervous breakdown through his dealings with Betsy. After he would complete some element of the house, she would change her mind, saying something like, Well, I like it. I like it. But do you think you can move that wall maybe three feet to the left? And she said to me, You know, I know you approved this plan and that you don't want a gigantic mansion. But do you think we could at least make the foundation three feet bigger all the way around? Three feet bigger doesn't sound like much. So I said, okay, really without thinking about it much. And by three feet out, she meant three feet out on every side of the house. And that turned a damn big house into an enormous mansion. 
and I really didn't want to be a slave to an enormous mansion. It's not just the monthly payments on the mortgage. It's the watering system for two acres of land, the grounds crew required to keep up the property, the property taxes, the insurance costs, the cost of maintenance, and so on. And the photo here really doesn't capture how enormous this house is, because much of the structure is in the back. And here's what our old street looks like. Wow. Our I don't think single motherhood would be so bad in that house, huh? Blessing. <laughs> this was on two acres of land, just down the street from the famous malls of Tyson's Corner, where you will find the Ritz Carlton and all the high end stores. So, this was primo real estate just outside of Washington, D.C., on Darrell Lane in Great Falls, Virginia. You can look up this street if you want. I wondered what my clients might think. They might conclude they are overpaying me. If you hire a lawyer, you really don't want the lawyer whose offices look like the Taj Mahal. You want a lawyer who looks like he's more interested in saving money, not spending money needlessly. You want a lawyer more like Better Call Saul. Well, maybe not Saul, but you get my point. And I think the same rule applies to an ad agency. Most clients, most businesses think they're being ripped off by their ad agency anyway. The last thing you want to do is reinforce that impression. But it wasn't just the house. We also had nice cars, a Jaguar, a big Lexus, an Audi A6. And of course, we had to join a fancy country club. The initial entry fee for this country club was $50,000. 50K? I get annoyed at the Soho House membership. I think it's way too expensive. 50 oh my gosh. Plus $800 per month. And that's before you spend any money at the club for dinners, at the nice restaurant and whatnot. Back then, this club was called Lowe's Island. It had two championship golf courses, approved for U.S. Open play, tennis courts, a swimming pool, and a really nice clubhouse with a fancy restaurant for fine dining. And this club was bought by Donald Trump. Of course. <laughs> and Trump loves making rich people stuff. Now called the Trump <laughs> National Golf Club. And I'm sure the initiation fee for this club today is 200000 or something like that. I tried to look up the initiation fee, couldn't find it. The website just says, contact the club. Betsy was very much into appearances and impressing our social circle. I yeah, was exactly. Someone put this in the chat. He couldn't say no to her. I see a lot of guys get in this predicament where they're just working a lot and they just don't really want to deal with their wife. So they just say, sure, sure, sure. And then they look back and they're like, what the hell? <laughs> what the? And this is the thing, like, these are the trad con women at church often. That's why I know, I, these trad con women, I grew up around these chicks. They'll play victim and talk about how amazing and awesome they are for years, for years. To that. D. Miller says the modern world has sadly fed the selfish centered instincts of men and women, the same time enabling the abuse of men by women. Guys, if you want me to read your your comments, um, sign up to the website because I'm reading their stuff first. Martin says, what a great live stream, Pearl. Thank you, Martin. Oh, and I didn't like being a slave to the monthly cost of this lifestyle. I was perfectly happy in our townhouse. Yeah, I knew we'd have to upgrade to a single family home as more kids are born, but I was not anticipating anything like the house we ended up with in Great Falls, Virginia. One of the breaking points for me was when Betsy said, you know, we really cannot live on anything less than $30,000 per month. And of course, that would be after taxes. And I'm like, are you kidding? And remember, this was in the 30K a month? <laughs> Freaking A. <laughs> <sighs> My lord. He 90, so tack on 50% for inflation. So that would be like $45,000 a month today, just to cover our fixed monthly costs. So when we say this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. And it is true that my ad agency was throwing off quite a bit of money, but I didn't know if that could be sustained. I would much rather bank that money than spend it on a big lifestyle with lots of overhead. And almost all my income came from a few big clients. I was not sure if this income was stable. Plus, I think I kind of had imposter syndrome. I really wasn't sure if I had just been lucky to build this business. What if my big clients went away? Would I be able to replace that income? What if the economy tanked? In the advertising business, the first expense that businesses cut is advertising. Guys, how much? You know, because women always say abuse, right? How much a month would you have to be paid to take a little bit of abuse? 
just like you know a hit here not saying you did that but you know i i <laughs> You know, because the same thing happened with Crowder's ex-wife. She's getting like 30K a month or something. I mean, how how much? Let me, I mean, just like a little bit. <laughs> yelling. How much of you, would you take some yelling for 30K a month? And marketing costs. The advertising business is very cyclical. Also, income tended to arrive sporadically, often big chunks, then nothing for a while. Plus, I had staff and offices I had to pay for. This just wasn't a lifestyle I wanted to be a slave to. I did not like the financial pressure. I didn't want to be a hamster on a wheel. I would be perfectly happy in a rural setting with a house on a hill overlooking a pond or a river. The kind of house that I grew up in in Vermont. That's my style. And that kind of life can be cheap. The last thing I wanted to do was support a giant infrastructure. Supporting a big infrastructure with big monthly costs is not my idea of living. That's slavery. To me, the best status symbol there is... And this is the thing, guys. Modern-day marriage is slavery. I know this sounds crazy, but this guy was put on child support until the kids were 22. That's over a decade where he has to pay a chick because he screwed her for a couple years. Had a couple kids. Now he's... Huh? 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 is a house with no mortgage. I'd much rather have a middle-class house with no mortgage than an enormous house with a big mortgage. This difference in attitude toward money... <laughs> Someone said Pearl can beat me for 30K a month. <laughs> Guys, stop! Stop it! <laughs> D. Miller says, I mostly live off the grid with my wife and five children on 26,000 a year. His wife is insane. Um, Martin says, Mr. Hart has an incredible spirit, and despite what happened to him. What life should look like created a lot of friction in my marriage to Betsy, who now wasn't really bringing any money to speak of because she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Well, she did have her weekly column for Scripps Howard News Service, but that only brought in about $1,000 a month, so basically nothing. And I was kind of wondering, where is all this money going? Why are our credit card balances so high? Also, why do you need a boob job? Why do you need a nose job? I like your nose the way it is. Lessig, what are the seven deadly sins? One of them's greed, right? Yeah, you see, this is, this is what always infects women. I don't know what it is about us. Not all, not all, not all, not all women. Some women. Dang it. <laughs> do you need liposuction? You're not fat at all. And why do you need a facelift? She was looking for that next husband. Your face looks fine. So we just had very different ideas about what life should look like. Despite all these tensions, we had more kids, which kept the marriage together. Even though the marriage was not great for a whole host of reasons. We were in fights all the time about money. And maybe one reason we had four kids was to keep the marriage going. I think we both knew the marriage was hanging by a thread. But we both believed in the institution of marriage until death do us part. We didn't believe in divorce. And I have a bit of a different view now. Till death do us part, worked fine when life expectancy was 28 years old. But realistically, how well does that work when life expectancy is 85? Hey, if you're lucky and marry the right person, great. But that's a bit of a moonshot. Half of marriages end in divorce. Among those marriages that last, about half of those marriages are in big trouble and mainly survive because of inertia. I'm not sure what the answer is, but that seems to be the state of affairs in America today. And the number one friction point in marriage is disagreements about money. I think marriage counselors... And that's why you always see these trad con guys saying, oh, well, men make more money because they're married. Well, yeah, because, I mean, women, a lot of women have a spending problem. <laughs> they got to make more money to pay for this broad. <laughs> Agree on that point. If you and your spouse are not in agreement about money... Can I put it at 1.5x speed? Yeah, I'm going to do that because we need to... I'm, I'm trying to... I should have time-stamped it earlier. I, I thought he got to the... I'm trying to get to the jail story. And what life should look like. It's going to be very tough to keep your marriage together. And what's great about Wanda is she's a penny pincher. Almost to an extreme. She's a coupon collector and saver. If she thinks she's being overbilled by Comcast or some service, she'll stay on the phone for hours to save $10. She wears them down. And she does this as a matter of principle. Even though it's really not worth all that time to save $10, I would just let it go. 
but not Wanda. That's just how Wanda is. Without getting into any more detail as to the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of the marriage with Betsy, I'll just say at this point, we agreed to separate in 2004 and divorce in 2005. And I decided to just pretty much let Betsy have all our assets, or 97%. Total college paid by Ben, 600000 Total subtotal child support, set almost a million. Total assets, she got $1.8 million. Total from Ben, $4 million? Would you take a little bit of abuse for four million dollars? Okay, so where am I signing up? <laughs> like, would you take like a beat down once a month? For how long? For like eighteen years. Damn. For four million though. What about like five years? Yeah, that's like boxing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Assets. And that, not saying you did, not saying you did. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just asking the question. At $1.8 million for Betsy. I kept $72,000. So $1.8 million for Betsy, $72,000 for me. Many ask, why would I agree to that arrangement? Usually marital assets are split 50-50. Well, my answer to that was I wanted to make sure that the kids could continue living at their current level and wouldn't need to downgrade their lifestyle because of the divorce. In addition, I initially agreed to pay Betsy about $18,000 per month in support. That was during the separation. This was later reduced to $12,000 per month after extensive litigation. And also, child support would last until age 22 for each child. In some ways, I thought this might be a money saver for me. Because Betsy was such a spendaholic, yes, the kids would be able to live at their current level for the most part, but Betsy would have limits on what she could spend on boob jobs, facelifts, clothes, lavish vacations, expensive landscaping, trips to the spa, fancy cars, and whatnot. She would probably have to host fewer fancy parties. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a wonderful church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. Betsy also proposed something else that I agreed to, foolishly as it turns out. She asked if it would be okay if she moved the kids to Illinois. Illinois is where Betsy is from, and it's where— And there are—I've uh, I've covered cases where the mom will actually leave the country. Again, you know— when fathers have kids, it's not their kids. It's the mother's kids. Emily is. I can work from anywhere. I'm a writer and a creative type. So I thought, sure, I'll just follow Betsy and the kids to Illinois, and I'll set up shop there. What I did not anticipate is that Betsy would subpoena all my clients. She thought I was probably hiding income and more money somewhere. My clients were not interested in being part of any lawsuits or any divorce proceeding. So they pretty much hightailed it for the tall grass, and this pretty much destroyed my business. Meanwhile, Betsy sold the house and moved the kids to Illinois almost instantly. I did not think that would happen that quickly. I thought that was more of an option or something that would take a while. But she moved almost instantly. And because Betsy had torpedoed my business with all of her subpoenas and deposition requests to my clients, I was not in a financial position to be able to move from Virginia to Illinois quickly. I figured it would take me about six months to be able to move to Illinois. Until then, I would travel from Virginia to Illinois every four or six weeks or so to see the kids until I could move there full time. Now, remember that approximately $1.8 million that Betsy was supposed to get at the end of the marriage and at the start of the divorce? Well, I was $100,000 short in terms of the final lump sum payment due that I owed in accordance with the divorce decree. So Betsy sued me for the $100,000 that I was short. I had been keeping up with the $12,000 in monthly support, but I wasn't able to come up with a $100,000 lump sum payment that I owed. And for those of you who have not seen the earlier video, I need to repeat a lot of what happened with this jail part. For those of you who have... Okay, this is what I was waiting for. So, I'm sorry, guys. I need to... Yeah. When, when volleyball's over, the tr the show is going to be A1. I won't be running from practice. It'll it'll be like you won't even, you won't even understand the level. The level we're going to get to. Some of you who are watching this have seen the other videos. So you can speed through this part if you've already heard it. But I will be adding some more detail here because people in the comments seem very interested in the jail story. So even if you think you've heard this before, you might want to keep listening. I'm adding quite a bit more detail on different aspects of this, but I also think the lessons learned from this can help a lot of people by showing dads what definitely not to do. Okay, so it's $100,000 short of the $1.8 million that I owed Betsy at the conclusion of the marriage and in accordance with the divorce decree. But I was keeping up pretty well with the $12,000 per month in support, though sometimes a bit late with payments. And because Betsy kept subpoenaing my clients and requesting to depose my clients, I had to invent an entirely new business. 
an online business. You can super chat at theaudacitynetwork.com. Even more helpful would be to sign up for a yearly membership, guys. We've been demonetized. I've been kicked off of Instagram three times, TikTok seven times at least. I lost count. Um, you know, it's been really tough. So if you guys can find it in your heart, Steve, even just the one month would be great. Ten dollars a month. I pay more attention to that chat and I I I read it. You know, we have Tom Twain, Mrs. Ziegler, D. Miller. At, at some point, we're gonna we're gonna add some courses in there. It's it's going to be going good. Instead of an Oh, cool. We got a new paid subscriber. We need to get like a button. Oh, a yearly. Thank you, James. Advertising agency. I launched an online education program on how to write effective advertisements and how to use direct marketing methods to build your business. This would ultimately be a pretty big success. But this new business was still in its startup phase when I entered Judge Leslie Alden's courtroom on July 26, 2006. My new internet business was starting to get some traction, was turning a small profit. Students were signing up and paying $38 per month for the program, but it still needed about six months to build up to a point where it was throwing off significant income. So I entered Judge Leslie Alden's courtroom with no lawyer. In fact, my lawyers quit the case the day before the hearing because I owed them a lot of money. I was pouring every dollar I could find into my new internet business. So this was kind of a triage situation going on. Triage is where you have to choose which wounded soldiers on the battlefield to try to save based on their likelihood of survival. That was my situation. I had to choose what to pay and what not to pay. I had to pay Betsy monthly support but could not pay her the final $100,000 lump sum owed. And I could not pay my lawyers. I figured they could wait. I needed to pour every dollar I could find into my internet business, knowing that each dollar invested would be returned in 45 days and would double in about 90 days. And this was early in the internet era, it being 2006. And internet marketing was not something I had really focused on until this point. When I decided to launch this, I didn't even know how to build a website. I was an offline marketer, mainly using physical direct mail, postal mail. So I had to quickly learn how to build a website, how to create an email marketing system and database, how to use Google Ads to drive traffic to my sales letter page, and how to build a membership website that could bill people monthly. Also how to set up a shopping cart, a payment processor, and be able to accept all major- Mark K says, man, you have been eye-opening as a 65-year-old. Thank you for watching, Mark K, and welcome to the membership program. We're at double digits on the live stream online, woo. Credit cards. I also had to get approved by all the credit card companies to be able to accept credit card payments, which was not easy because my Yeah, and that's was... someone in the chat put, this man went through all of this just to be called a deadbeat. Do you know how hard it is to make $2 million? I know how easy it is to lose money. <laughs> Sorry, that's not funny. <laughs> Horrible by this point. Had fallen to in the 500s. So I had to put up bonds with the credit card companies. It was quite a process. Oh, we got a new subscriber. Oh my gosh. Hey, Kurt, welcome. I'm a standstill. Wanda was also involved in helping. She was my tech support. She actually knew a lot more about tech than I did. Plus, she didn't mind spending hours on the phone with customer support to have them walk her through how to do all of this. So I entered Judge Alden's courtroom. With one look at Judge Leslie Alden's haircut, I knew I was dead. Finito. Gonzo. He's the law. I especially knew I was finito when she started asking me questions. I was spending about $5,000 a month on Google Ads to generate students and maxing out my credit cards. And remember, the metric was that it was taking about 45 days to turn a profit on the Google AdWords spend. People would sign up for a cost of $1 for the first month's trial membership. This would then become $38 per month if they stuck with the program. And students could cancel at any time. Later, this business became a pretty huge success, generating about $100,000 per month in gross sales or about $50,000 per month in profit. But it was only generating about $10,000 per month by that point, with about $5,000 per month going to Google Ads. To say that Judge Alden was unimpressed with my startup internet business is an understatement, to an extreme. And Betsy was in the courtroom with her lawyers. Wanda was also in the courtroom, seated toward the back where she would not be noticed much. 
Instead of maxing out my credit cards and spending every cent I could find on Google ads, Judge Alden thought I should be sending that money to Betsy. The problem with that is, I would have no business and no income if I did that. I would therefore not be able to pay Betsy the $100,000 lump sum that I owed her, or the $12,000 per month in support. With no business and no steady source of income, Betsy would get zero. And I explained all this to Judge Alden. I said realistically it would probably take me six months before I could pay Betsy this $100,000, plus keep up the $12,000 per month in payments, all while also building my internet business. It requires money to build a business. But Judge Alden just kept asking me the same question over and over again. Mr. Hart, what is your plan for paying Mrs. Hart the hundred? Oh my gosh. People don't know how to do math. You know, you know I, got, I got accused of having slave colonizer contracts last year because a certain someone was too stupid to add. Sorry. Thank you. Some dollars you owe her. And my answer was always some variation of this. This is girl math. It's girl math. Just wait. Girl math. Your Honor, I will pay Betsy the $100,000 I owe her as soon as I possibly can. And then I'd explain that Betsy destroyed my ad agency by sending subpoenas to all of my clients. I am now building a new business that's working, an online marketing education business. But it needs about six more months to build up. Again, Judge Alden would ask, Mr. Hart, What's your plan for paying Mrs. Hart the $100,000 you owe her? And I would come back with essentially the same answer. Your Honor, I will pay Betsy the $100,000 as soon as I can. I just need some more time for my internet business to build. Judge Alden had my bank statements and my credit card. Yeah, and that's the thing. You lose money before you make money. You lose money before you make money. But again, well, thank you for the new subscriber. Uh. Oh, it was a, it was, was, is it a super chat? Yeah. Okay. Modern women hate their husbands more than they love their, can you read it? I can't, I can't see it here. Wait, where is it? Oh, it's at the bottom. Okay, never mind. Women should never be judged. No, 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 no. Sorry, YouTube. I'm sorry. Most women should never be judges. No. Most. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Wait, what did I do? So no. Wait, what I did, did I do? Okay, wait. Uh, what did I? Oh, okay. I turned off the lighting. Okay, hold on. <laughs> sorry, guys. I got carried away. <laughs> um, women should never. I, I did it again. D, you're killing me. <laughs> you're killing me. Um, women should never. <laughs> I'm so stupid. Sorry. Some women, some women should never be judges. While there are few men in today's day and age that have learned to judge logically and impartially without emotion, I have not met a single woman that can do so. <gasps> Even me! <laughs> I'm still a woman! And this is why people always think I'm trying to, like, uh, say that I'm special or different. No! I'm still a chick. Every chick, is, we have a default programming. We have default. Abandon the kids at all. Betsy and I got a divorce. About half of marriage. Wait, what? Did I, oh no, did I lose the timestamp? No. $12,000 per month in support. So all in all, I'm $148,000 short in okay. terms of immediate cash due. Why the hell did you agree to all that? Asked the processing officer. Who was oh, this? Did he get to be in jail if you had just paid what you owe? Oh, here. We're back here. And I was still dressed in my business suit when I entered this large holding cell area, which is really like a giant. Welcome, Tara. Welcome, Ezekiel. Okay. Cage with maybe 40 other inmates in there. The jail door clanks behind me. An enormous 300 pound black guy called Big Daddy said to me, Hey, what are you in here for with that nice suit, red tie, and shiny shoes? Some kind of computer fraud or bank fraud or oh, something? Oh, wait, did I, were we? We weren't there yet, right? I think we're here. Part to the custody of the sheriff. What the? At this point, police officers... Here. But there was this big Google ad spend. Oh, okay, here we go. So not much net income yet. Then Judge Alden picked up a copy of a book I had written. It was sitting there on her desk, titled How to Write Blockbuster Sales Letters, which is a great book, by the way. Judge Alden starts reading from the book, 
She quotes a passage from my book. The people you are writing your sales letters to are not stupid. They are intelligent people. Pretend you are writing your sales letter to Warren Buffett. Anticipate the questions he might have. The people you are writing to are not idiots. She then looks at me and says, I'm not an idiot, Mr. Hart. What is your plan for paying Mrs. Hart the $100,000 you owe her? And I said, Your Honor, I don't know what else to say beyond what I've already said. I will pay her as much as I can each month in addition to the $12,000 per month that I've been paying her and will continue to pay. But I think it's going to take four to six months for me to build up my internet business enough so I can pay her the $100,000. At this point, Judge Alden said, Mr. Hart, you are remanded to the custody of the sheriff. Bailiff, remand Mr. Hart to the custody of the sheriff. At this point, police officers put my hands behind my back and put the handcuffs on. I'm like, what's happening here? I try to tell Judge Alden, Your Honor, I'm supposed to teach an online class tonight to my students who are paying $38 a month. What the heck? I don't think she heard me, or if she did, she didn't care. I look at Betsy and her legal team as I'm being hauled out of the courtroom. I silently mouth the words, What the F to them? And then I look at Wanda, who is sitting more toward the back of the courtroom, and I silently mouth the words to her, What the F? And Wanda's looking pretty distressed. I'm walked out the door by the officer. The door is connected directly to a small elevator, which is really a cage as I remember it, which goes straight down into the basement of the prison. And I'm in this sort of cage-like elevator with one police officer. And my hands are cuffed behind my back. I say to the officer, what just happened? He says, this happens a lot in Judge Alden's courtroom. I feel bad for you. The next thing you know, I'm sitting in a large holding cell in Fairfax County, Virginia jail with a big crowd of inmates waiting to be processed in to include MS-13 gang members and members of the notorious R Street gang in Washington, D.C. Some of them look like they were from the movie Menace to Society. And I was still dressed in my business suit when I entered this large holding cell area, which is really like a giant cage with maybe 40 other inmates in there. The jail door clanks behind me. An enormous 300-pound black guy called Big Daddy said to me, Hey, what are you in here for with that nice suit, red tie, and shiny shoes? Some kind of computer fraud or bank fraud or something? And I said, Nah, I came up short on money I owe to my ex-wife. So I launch off into my story about what just happened in Judge Leslie Alden's courtroom. Big Daddy called out to the other inmates. He said, Hey, guys, come over here. You got to hear this guy's story. This story is great. And they all gathered around to listen. And Big Daddy was clearly the dominant figure in the group. His voice was loud and booming. Plus, he was huge. I would guess he's about six foot seven. I was sitting on the cement bench next to Big Daddy. We were there for many hours because life in jail is not a fast moving process. And they all seemed to like me. They were all laughing, including the guy with the Nazi swastika tattoo on his face. And they all couldn't believe I agreed. How funny is it this guy's hanging out with people with the Nazi? Like, what? My ex, $1.8 million plus the $12,000. Someone said Big Daddy was falling in love. <laughs> Guys, chill out. Chill out. I was still $100,000 short. Well, actually, I was short more than that because Judge Alden had also awarded Betsy attorney's fees plus interest. So the bill I owed her at this point was $148,000. One guy who looked like a character out of Menace to Society goes, what the F did you give her all that money for and leave yourself with nothing? Then Big Daddy says, here's what you need to do. You need to phone your ex. And you need to say in your sweetest possible voice, you need to say, dear, sweetie, honey, I can't pay you any money sitting in here. And then make a deal. And there was one phone in the holding area. But there was a big line of inmates waiting to use the phone. And he needed a phone card to use the phone. I didn't have a phone card yet. Big Daddy had a phone card, which he let me use at his expense. That was just amazing. Big Daddy was awesome. He didn't have to do that. I'm very glad he liked me. I was able to get Betsy on the phone, but this was a little bit like having... Tara said, my dad experienced something similar. It gets even worse when CPS gets involved and says, your, bro your father should only have supervised visits because a CPS cunt observed an open Bible in his home. Wow. And I, I think we're going to do maybe like one or two call-ins at the end of this. 
Um, so if you guys have a story that's similar to this, you know, feel free to call in at the end. Negotiation with Osama bin Laden. She just kept saying, well, you wouldn't be in jail if you had just paid what you owe. And she seemed pretty amused by the whole thing. Fortunately, I had a wonderful support network, and I had had a... a $1.8 million! Brett, please offer a retraction on this. Dear God, please. Please, I'm begging you, please. Full church life and, and was already walking with God, and then he used that to come in and draw me, I think, so much closer to himself. So when we say, this is really hard, but I'm walking with God anyway. I also call Wanda to tell her what's happening. She's obviously very upset and cussing out Betsy. And I couldn't stay on the phone long because there was a big line of inmates waiting to use the phone. Plus, I didn't want to run up the bill on Big Daddy's phone card. Then one of the guards called out my name. And I exited the holding cell area with the guards. I never saw Big Daddy again. What a bigger-than-life character. A guard put me in... I wonder what happened to Big Daddy. and led me to the processing area. I was seated handcuffed to a metal chair next to an officer who was inputting data into a computer. He pulled up my record. He looked at my record and said, what did you say to this judge to get one year in jail? Wait, I'm here for a year? What for? Judge Alden had never said anything about this. All she had said was bailiff remand Mr. Hart to the custody of the sheriff. That was all she said. Nothing about one year in jail. Doesn't that require a trial and a jury or something? Nope. For contempt of court, a judge can put you into jail for up to one year. And then I guess extend it from there if she wants. So the officer read from the screen and says, well, this says you're here for contempt of court. It says you owe $148,000 to your ex-wife and you're here for a year. How did you get $148,000 behind on your child support, he asks. And I said, well, it's not really support. I paid my ex about $1.7 million in the assets we had, which was pretty much all our assets, but I still owe her $148,000 to bring the total to $1.8 million in cash up front and at the get-go. I also agreed to pay her $12,000 per month in support. So all in all, I'm $148,000 short in terms of immediate cash due. Why the hell did you agree to all that, asked the processing officer. Who was this judge in your case? Judge Leslie Alden, I said. Oh, that explains it, said the cop. Yep, that judge really hates. Oh, no way. I can contact her? $475 an hour. And DM it to me. DM me if you, if you have the link on Instagram. What's my new Instagram name? It's like just pearly things official. Yeah, but you guys should go follow me on there because they del I used to have like 400K. They deleted it. Big L, they took that away. It's, eh, it's just annoying. Then, this happens a lot in her courtroom. After the officer finished inputting my info and giving me an inmate number, I was taken in cuffs to an area and given a green jumpsuit. Now, I said in my previous video that it was an orange jumpsuit, but Wanda reminds me that it was actually green. This was 18 years ago. And I always think of pretty The cops then took my business clothing, wallet, watch, phone, and everything I had and, and put it all in a plastic bag for safekeeping to be returned whenever I get out. The next thing you know, I'm buck naked and getting a full body cavity search by police officers in the basement of the Fairfax County, Virginia jail before getting into my prison jumpsuit and chained to 11 other inmates. We were led to our cell block. My cellmate was a Cherokee Indian who said he had been convicted of 47 felonies, and right now he's in for attempted murder. We actually got along very well. He gave me lots of great legal advice. He told me I would not really be in there for a year. This is contempt of court. The judge is just trying to scare the shit out of you. Your number one objective right now, he said, is to find a way to get a letter to the judge. You've got to say whatever you have to say to get out of here. And this is no white collar work release type program for nonviolent offenders. It's clear Judge Leslie Alden really wanted to send me a message by putting me here. There are about 1,800 inmates in the Fairfax County Jail. The way our cell block was set up is there was one common area that linked to six cells where we slept. Each cell has two cement beds for two inmates. On the cement bed is a thin pad, barely a pad at all, really, and no pillow. 
and my cellmate was the Cherokee Indian. We would talk for hours in there, not just about my legal case, but about philosophy of life and all kinds of stuff. We were locked out of our sleeping cells all day, so the 12 inmates in this cell block were in the same small all-cement common area all day. So we spent all day there just shooting the bull. There was one toilet and one shower out in the open in plain view of everyone. And you got used to it after a while. I got along fine with everyone, even though most were in there on serious violent felony charges. We spent a lot of time talking about how to get me out of there. In fact, that was the main topic of conversation. Everyone agreed with the Cherokee Indian that I needed to write a letter to the judge and offer a payment plan. We talked about how much I should offer. I thought maybe $2,000 a month. They all thought that was way too much. Problem is, if you can't come up with the money every month, you'll be right back here, said the MS-13 guy who was covered in tattoos, including tattoos on his face. Offer $300 a month, said the white guy with a Nazi swastika tattoo on his neck who looked like Charles Manson. I settled on offering $1,000 a month to Judge Leslie Alden and see what happens. Everyone in the cell block thought this was way too much. The Cherokee Indian thought that Judge Leslie Alden would probably let me out if I offered $500 per month. But I decided on $1,000. I wanted to get out of there. I didn't want to take a chance on offering too little and then maybe have to be there another week or another month or whatever. I also figured Judge Alden isn't stupid. She must know I can't pay Betsy anything sitting in here. And my ex was already getting $12,000 per month. But I could not continue paying that if I'm sitting... D says, sadly, I won't activate TikTok, Telegram, or Facebook because I view them as communist-controlled platforms. Uh, tw Twitter is a little better, but I'm glad you started the Audacity Network. Thank you. You know, and that's what I'm trying to do. I really want this network to be funded by the people for the people. I, I don't want big donors. I don't want, you know, I, I, I want to be able to create movies someday. I want to create all of the content that, you know, is just, you know, even music someday. That's really the vision I see. I want to get like based professions, based lawyers, based there. I'd even sign a liberal, honestly. We want someone to debate. What, what, what's the what's the harm? Free speech, you know. Um, we also got a new invoice. Or, oh, and, oh, that's the, the same thing. Okay. Here. So it was in everyone's interest to get me out of there pronto so I could start making money again. The problem is... <laughs> Tara says, so convicted murderers and felons are easier to get along with than his ex-wife. <laughs> could not get a pen. We were not allowed to have anything that could be used as a weapon. After three days in there, I got a visit from the head of the prison, the warden himself. He came all the way down to the deepest, darkest hole in the prison to find out what I had done to end up there. Out of the 1,800 inmates, he wanted to talk to me, Ben Hart. I guess he had read my file and wanted to hear the story. So how did you get $148,000 behind on your child support, he asked. And why did the judge put you in here? The warden was talking to me through the bars of a small window in the steel door of our cell block. I explained that I did not get $148,000 behind on my child support. I then went through all the details of how I paid her close to $1.7 million plus $12,000 a month in support, all payments made. But I had fallen $100,000 short on the $1.8 million we'd agreed to. Then the judge tacked on another $48,000 for interest and attorney's fees. Just wasn't able to come up with the final $100,000 plus the $48,000. Who was the judge, the warden asked. Judge Leslie Alden, I answered. That explained it, said the warden. She's a real man-hater. Looks like you really pissed her off. He paused. He looked at his file of papers. He then said, Even though you've been sentenced to be here, I'm going to move you to work release. Trouble is, we don't have any jobs for you that will help you pay off this $148,000 debt. The jobs we have pay $7 an hour. People who are in work release are there because they're behind on child support. They pay their child support that way. But this is not going to help you get out of your situation. Well, let me see what I can do about this. I can't have you down here. About a day later, guards arrive. They take me to the work release facility. This was low security. I was able to get a pen and write a letter to Judge Leslie Alden. With my proposal to pay my ex $1,000 per month toward the $148,000 that I owed her. Plus keep up with my other obligations under the divorce decree. And actually, they would not let me write my letter with a full-blown pen. 
What they gave me was a flexible plastic ink cartridge with a metal writing tip on the end of it. Right, metal writing tip on the end of it. And it looked kind of like this, though. I think it was, it was clear. I think it was actually, it was a lot more flexible than this. And it was not easy to write a decent looking letter with this flexible ink cartridge. You had to try to hold the metal tip, the metal tip like this, and then write, write the letter that way. So I eventually got this letter written, but I couldn't get a guard to agree to take my letter to Judge Leslie Alden. So I called Wanda. And she could not come and get my letter because it's not visitor's day. I asked Wanda to talk to the lawyers I had not paid, who had quit my case the day before my hearing with Judge Alden. Lawyers were allowed to visit inmates pretty much any time, since legal representation is a constitutional right. A junior lawyer for the firm came to the jail and took my letter to Judge Leslie Alden's office. I did not hear anything back. I thought, well, I guess I'm here for a year. And I started to accommodate myself to that reality. It's amazing how humans can get used to almost any reality over time. Whatever situation is becomes the new normal. The uh, Blessing, can you put the call in link in the chat? Because we're going to, I'm going to watch this for a little longer, but I think you guys get the idea. I'm going to go a little longer. You have it, right, Blessing? Okay. Why, why don't you put it in the YouTube chat and in the Audacity chat, not X. So guys, if you have a story similar to this, you want to share if you went through the system, um, Try to make the story condense, like don't, um, unless it's this crazy, you know, but don't give me like, but to the point story, okay? Baseline for existence. And I met some very interesting people in there, including a high powered attorney who apparently was in there on some kind of fraud. But I would say that most of the people in work release were in there because they had fallen behind on child support. They would mm -hmm. work during the day. And the and other crazy thing is many, are in there also are in homeless shelters because they've dealt with family court. This is everywhere, guys. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Turn to jail at night. The jobs were things like pick up the trash on the side of the road, wash windows on buildings, hang drywall, manual labor type jobs. And the pay I think was $7 an hour. This money would then be sent to the mother of their children until they got caught up with whatever they owe. Now, until then, I didn't know we still had debtors' prisons in America. I thought debtors' prisons in the Western world went out with the 19th century, or even the 18th century. Wrong. America's prisons are packed with dads who have fallen behind on their child support. Now, technically, you're not in jail for the debt. So I guess technically they're not debtors' prisons. You're in jail for contempt of court. If you are behind on your court-ordered payments, you are by definition in contempt of court. And even though it's work release on pretty low security, it doesn't mean there aren't rough characters in there. There were some truly scary inmates in work release, one white guy in particular. He offered to solve my problem with my ex for $800. I won't even repeat the details of what he said could be done. Okay. So I stayed away from him. Okay, but, but you see, uh, so Brett, sorry, this was, I need to organize it better. I'm telling you. I'm telling you guys, this show is going to go to new heights when volleyball season is over. Right now, I still have a crazy volleyball schedule. I'm there like four days a week. I have personal tra I do a lot. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm curious, guys. Have any of you experienced something similar? Um, the link is in the chat. It's a Zoom link. Do we have anyone on the line? You just put it in, right? Um. But, but these are, these are the, the deadbeat dads of America. The majority of these cases, remember, attorneys will tell you nine out of ten times when a child is alienated from the parent, it's the mother doing it to the father. And what I've seen personally is when the father does it to the mother, it's usually, it's usually maybe the new girlfriend or his mom in the way. Men aren't really big gossipers. That's, that's just not a man thing to do. Women, on the other hand, um, okay, so, so the question is, what is your divorce story? What, what is your experience with family courts? We have someone up.
Okay. Hello. What's your name? Hey, my name is Zion. Zion? Zarin, like Aaron. Oh, Z oh, Zarin. Okay. Hi, Zarin. Where are you at? I'm in uh, Maryland. Oh, in Maryland. So what is your divorce story or your experience with family court? Well, I, I got like a little different story, but when I watched this, it reminded me of uh, like my father, he was married to my mom. And like, it was like a point in there where like, uh, she just was like so unappreciative, like the, his wife, the guy's wife. Mm -hmm. And like, Man, it just reminded me of my of my mother and father situation for the longest, and he just wouldn't tell her no. And like, I don't know, like, it was just crazy, man. Like, I had uh, my father had cancer and stuff, and like, she she left my father, but they never got uh, divorced. Mm -hmm. So like, after um a while, like, I don't know, she just she just really didn't care about him at all. But because me and her don't really have a good relationship, she don't got a good relationship with the rest of my siblings. They they not her children and stuff. Like, I don't know. She she did something out of spite. She went and like picked my father up from his house. He was actually like afraid of her because of how far that she would go in court and stuff like that. Like she's done it all my life. They're constantly in court with his mother, his sisters, all types of stuff. You said and like he was so afraid of what. She what did what did he what did he do for your mom? Like you said, he did a lot for her. Yeah, like you know when he did, well they didn't get married till I was like nine or ten, mm -hmm. but he always paid her rent. He always like you know she lived with him. She never paid rent. If she did pay bills, it was like small bills here and there. She she never needed to have a job. Like she out like out of my whole life, she just started having a career maybe like five or six years ago. Like she never had like a, a real a real career, you know what I'm saying? He paid everything for her, everything. And she left him. Like it was it's a lot that was going on in between it and all that stuff. But he just would he was just like head over heels. I don't I'm not even gonna say in love with it. He was like really scared of the consequences of a divorce. Mm -hmm. And I hate it. I hate to hear like when I when I see the story like that, like the guy who you who you just uh the clip that you were just watching, he should have been divorced her, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I really think that he was really afraid of divorce her, just like my father. And like uh it was like a like at the latter part of my father's life, he had cancer and stuff like that. And uh my mom went and took him from his house to her house so that nobody could see him. I had to go to like all types of stuff. I went to I didn't even know they had something called adult protective services. I had to go to like adult protective services. I was like calling like the police to go do checkups on him while he's at our house because nobody could see him until I started doing all that stuff. And I still couldn't go see him because me and her don't have a good relationship. But it was like so much pressure on her, she had to let somebody over there. Hmm. So and she, I, so she know, stole your dad, basically. So she wouldn't let anyone see him? Straight up kidnapped him. Like, she, like me and my grandma, her mother have a good relationship. She don't even got a relationship with my grandma. But like because me and her was on the out, she started talking to my grandma. And the day that she did that, she told, she texted my grandma and told her, like, yeah, I kidnapped your son-in-law. Like, laugh out loud. Wow. And, so, and, and so like, you, you know, my father. So you called Adult Protective Services. Adult Protective Services. I call, like, they got, like, a, uh, it's called, like, a wellness checkup. Mm -hmm. I had to do a wellness checkup, like, a couple, few times, like, a few times, because I talked to my father every day. It was, like, my best friend, you know. Um, I used to talk to my father, like, every day. And then all of a sudden, like, no, I just couldn't talk to him. I paid for his phone, paid his phone bill. I, I still don't got that phone. He died, like, he died, like, a month ago in her care. Like, he never was, he was never as bad as he was in her care. And, like, now wow. he gone. You know what I'm saying? It's be, and it's because, like, you know, she was just being spiteful. I actually tried to put a video out there so I could, like, you know, get some help. Because, like, the police was, like, sym sympathetic towards me. They, like, you know, we can't do nothing because they're married. I'm like, what? So she can just, like, do whatever to them just because they married? And it's like, yeah, you know, I don't know. I got even, like, I got videos of me and him, like, talking about stuff. And he would tell, tell me, like, you know, when somebody got a personality like hers, when they approach me, I just back up. And I was like, I, keep, I kept trying to tell him, you know what I mean, why he had, like, some, uh, why he, like, was... Like doing well, doing well enough to like just be out on his own and move and stuff. He would come to my house and stuff like that, and we'd be talking and stuff like. That. I got this part on camera. He was like, "Yeah, when I would, when somebody like her approached me, I just back up." And I kept trying to tell him like, 
somebody like her will push you off the cliff if you keep backing up, man. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it happened, man. It just happened. I just hate to see men, like, really afraid of women. It's like, you know, if it would, the worst that could happen, of course, is, like you said, you lose the 50-50. He gave up 97%. Mm -hmm. You know, that was crazy. You know what I mean? But I used to always tell my father, because he used to, like I said, they was in court my whole life. And he used to always say, it's cheaper to keep her. And I'm like, and when he got cancer, I asked him, I was like, I mean, you know, you probably only got cancer because, you know, because of her, like, you know what I mean? But you it's think not that, cheaper you to keep her, man. She, I, you think that she gave him cancer? She stressed him so much. I mean, you know, oh, obviously other yeah. stuff. But, you know, like, he was the type of guy that would pull up to the house mm -hmm. and stay in the truck, stay in his car for like an hour or two in the driveway. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, because he didn't want to come in the house. That he, that he, you know, paying for, like, nice house, man, you know what I mean? Like, took care of all his kids and stuff like that. And she, like, I mean, like I said, man, I made a video trying to trying to get people, I mean, I should I should take it down for real, but, you know, like, because he's already gone now. I was trying to get him back from her house, but it was crazy. I just don't want people to be afraid of their parent, I mean, of their, of their uh, spouse, man, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. we don't live in a time where you can, like, actually be killed or you know what I mean or anything like that you you can you can just separate from people you know what I mean and actually divorce like during the during the last part of his life like right before she went and took him she came over the house and cursed him out because she wasn't in the will like he's he left the house to me and my brother me and one of my brothers and then he had another house that he was leaving you know and he had cars and stuff boats and stuff like that a boat and stuff he left all that stuff to like us and I got it on text message on the video that I posted it's on her text message showing all that stuff. She like, yeah, don't write me out the will. It was just crazy, man. It was crazy. And she did all that. She changed his will. Then we probably gonna have to go to court for she that. Changed, I really don't even changed, want to go to court. She changed his will. How could she do I've that? I've never seen. I've never seen him. Well, he never registered it at first. So when she when he was over her house, I've never seen him in so in worse condition. And the last time I ever seen him, he was at the hospital, and I went to the hospital to see him. And he was like really in pain. I never ever seen him in that bad condition. He was really in pain. I'm like, hey man, you all right? He's do like, you, yeah, you know, I'm like. Do you think that she had something to do with his death? Is that like, do you think that? I truly do. I I truly do, but I didn't really want to say that because I I can't prove it. You know, he's already buried and stuff, so it's not yeah. like I've heard. I've you heard know what I mean? From like, I've heard similar stories to that. He told one of our buddies. He told one of our buddies. You know, because he like, you know, all our friends love my father. Like. Mm -hmm. Soon was packed, you know, with our friends and stuff like that. So he told one of our buddies, like I said, until I did all that stuff, nobody was going to see him. And then when it, when they could go to see him, like one of my buddies went over there, he was kind of close to him. And he told him, man, he told him, he said, he said, he told me like maybe a week before he died. He's like, yeah, man, your father said, he said, your father told me that he think your mother is overdosing. I've never seen my father. I've never, he said that he told him that. While he was over there, over my mother's house, he he said that he told him that. Wow. I've never, ever, ever, I've never seen my father in that bad a condition as I seen him in her condition. And, like, I mean, like, I don't know. And she just, I don't know, like, nobody in my family want to do anything to her because they feel like she always get away with it. But I keep telling them, only reason she gets away with it is because you guys let her get away with it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you don't never follow through. No one ever follows through because they scared of how far she'll go. But I'm like, man, we don't live in a time where somebody can, like, really exercise their will against you just, you know, relentlessly without any consequence. You know what I mean? It's, you can always document and call the police. But my father didn't believe in that. That was the worst part. And I think that's how the guy was, too. Like, he didn't want to do anything for the break of the family. So I, I, I would, I'd be willing to bet, I'm pretty sure you would be, too, mm -hmm. that the wife is the one who was like, all right, it's over. Because he never really say who did that you know what I mean he said they just came to an agreement I'd be willing to bet if she never did that he'd probably still be willing mm -hmm. yeah or or she may he may be caught her cheating or something like because men don't usually end it unless there's like a real crazy reason yeah shoot man you know it's, it's people it's men out here nowadays that will forgive that man that's kind of crazy but it is it is yeah. what it is I'm sorry to hear about your dad. You should you should file a police report. I mean, you don't know who's gonna be sick next, you know. I mean, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure like she, there's gonna be nobody else that that she can do this to unless it's like maybe like I don't know her sister or something. Like that. No one else would yeah put themselves in. You know what I mean? And like I said, is is only because it's only because 
she um my father was like just so afraid of her. I actually tried to get you. I tried to. I I sent you a um. I sent you a DM on on um. On Twitter on X because mm-hmm. I was trying to get you to you know help me out too. I was trying to get anybody to help me out. Mm-hmm. But like I posted the videos up there. It was just it was it was a nasty thing, man. I just now my you know my father's gone now, and I just I really don't. I see I see it kind of like this in other people too. Like it's not really. It's not really like it's only be it's only because people allow this stuff to happen. That's that's my biggest that I guess that's my biggest takeaway from this whole situation. Everything that happened was because people were too afraid to just stand up. And I'm like, man, I just can't believe the world we live in. What did your when you were a kid, did your mom like speak ill of your dad to you? Did you ever think that he oh, was Oh my god. Did you yeah. ever think that he was the bad guy? Oh no, nah, never that because he never left. Like, he never, ever, even when me and my mom lived by ourselves, like, he lived close enough to all, you know, he had, mm. he had my, my mom, his, his other, uh, his other ex-wife, and, uh, he lived, like, in between us, and so we used to, he used to always come over, pick me up, he ne- never has my father been an absent person in my life, mm-hmm. like, and, and he always, like, my mom was, like, what the, you know how, like, the ladies try to make it seem like, oh, yeah, the, the man's so abusive, the man's so abusive, I'm always just, like, you know what I mean? Like I rarely have ever seen <laughs> like a man really be the abusive one in the family. I've mm-hmm. seen multiple times where the woman is yeah, the abusive it's, one. It's almost and like it's almost always the women. If the man's almost a, always if it if the man's abusive, it's it's usually mutual. That's that's what I've seen. It's usually and she usually starts it. Yeah, and I mean, like my father was almost like a whole foot taller than my mom too, and she was the one always starting shit. So you yeah. know, like it's. Like I, it's a it's a terrible it's a terrible time that we live in now to where like even even being even being like even your stature being physically dominant won't stop somebody from yeah. <laughs> won't and, stop won't stop a woman from doing that. And did your dad ever defend himself or no? Never. Like Never. one time she one time she would call the police so many times. One time she called the police so many times in one night mm-hmm. that that the police said, yeah, if we if we come back here today, somebody's going to jail. She called the police again. They locked her up. <laughs> oh, well, that never happens. Well, it's because my yeah, brother, yeah. he, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he definitely, <laughs> that's, that's I laughed. He told that's like, I was like, that takes a lot for the police to lock up a woman. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. So I don't know. It's just, whew, it's a lot, man. I, I really hope, I really hope that people who are watching this take, take real, um, take real heed to what's, what, because I'm telling you, this is the worst situation, man. And like the, the, the daughter, the daughter on that, oh my God, man, that's you know I'm trying not to say too much, but that's I feel like she's like despicable for that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he went through so much. Like that's why I'm so highly upset about the things that's just going on in my life for like the past like years. So cause my father did so much just to be around us and take care of us and stuff like that, and I never, never not appreciated it. And man, I swear to God, like that lady, that that girl that doing that, what's her name? It's just despicable to me. It's like, man, like yeah. you don't know how many people you know how many people I know will give their right arm to be in her position. You know what I mean? Like right-handed people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like give their right arm yeah. to have a father who really loved them that much and she shitting on him like that. It's just Yeah. It's the worst thing. Yeah, well, and it, it, it you know, it, the, the mom says that for 20 years a lot of kids believe it. And that's really what I'm trying to wake people up to is that the the moms are moms are not these innocent victims that they they so, some are but it by and large they, they're not these innocent victims that they pretend to be. And a lot of times they're they're the actual real villains if you look into it. I swear like that's I'm telling you like I feel like that's the only reason I feel like I shouldn't take that video down cuz I don't know who's going to watch it but yeah. I put all the messages up there and everything, and you you can obviously see who the victim is. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, and and who the villain is. Like, I mean, maybe if there's ways, like my, maybe if there's ways that you know, like other men could protect their fathers if they're in a similar. I don't know if I don't know. I, I'm that you're the first one um, that I've heard tried to get the law involved, and they it didn't work. So. Maybe if there's like, is there any way that like they could have protect you could have protected him or no? See, I feel like, oh, well, the, the only thing I could have done because like I've been, 
I've been like, the, like since he died, I've been thinking about it since so much. And I'm like, man, I did something wrong. I did something wrong. Like the number one thing I did wrong was like, uh, he told me, cause like sometimes, you know, like my mom, she had like all this leave and stuff like that. So sometimes he would just ask like, hey, can you take me to the doctor sometime? So like one day, I guess she went and picked him up and like, she started cursing him out about not, about her not being, her not being in the wheel and stuff. So he, was, he called me, he's like, yeah, man. I want her. I want her talk. I want her taking me nowhere ever again. Like you know what I mean. Like I'm be asking you. I said, "Oh yeah, I got you, man." You know the type of job I had at the time. I could just say yes or no to work, and I could take him any day. You know what I mean. I should have told him because he was getting a little bit weak. I should have told him at that time, like, "Man, come stay with me for a while." You know what I mean. Yeah. Like I, to me, that's the only thing I feel like I could have done because I went to the police. And they was and they wanted to help me, but they like we we can't really do nothing, man. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So then, uh, but I do feel like if if it was the other way around, I feel like they would have exhausted every opportunity they could have. Correct. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if it was a woman, yeah. Yeah. So I I do feel that like that, but like that's the only thing I could say. Like if other men, if they got in some type of situation, um, I don't know. I guess maybe like. Just be brave enough to like step up and and don't don't um take for granted how much somebody might need you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like somebody who's been always been there for you. Don't take for granted how much somebody might need you because like I sh- I should have did that. I should have been like, nah, man, just come to my house. You sleep in my bed. I sleep on the couch, man. You know, I should have did that. You know what I mean? Cause I I pr- I'm pretty sure he would still be here because. I only moved back home. I was in the military. I only moved back home because he got sick. And that was like in 2016. Mm. And the doctor said he would be dead in April 2017. But we like put him on like this restrictive diet and stuff. And like uh, the cancer actually went away for a while. You know what I mean? And then it came back. So we was about to do the same thing. And while we on the way to doing the same thing, boom, she went over there and took him from his house. Wow. And made sure like... Like my brother, when he finally was able to go over there, he was scared to. He was scared to like. He was scared to help him out. He was scared, scared to like give him like, you know, herbs and stuff like that. Cause we like we we study we study all types of like alternative medicine and stuff like that. Like his doctor, his cancer doctor. Um, I forget what they call it, but oncologist, his oncologist. He talks about him when he gives classes. He's like, this guy was supposed to be dead a long time ago. You know, his sons came and came and like rallied up and helped him. I don't know what they did, but, you know, I hope he sticks to it because he was supposed to be dead a long time ago, and now we can't even detect the cancer in his body. Wow. So, like, it it worked. It just came back because he just, you know, I guess he started doing the same thing that he was doing before and all that stuff. But, yeah, you know, like he like my brother, when he went over there, he was scared to even give him, the, do the stuff for him that we did that worked in the first place. Mm-hmm. Well, thank- Like, that's how, that's how. Mm-hmm. Oh, going. go ahead. You're yeah. good. I was about to say that's just how that's how like vengeful that's how vengeful and like yeah uh that's how scared that that's how scared people are of her and stuff like that like <laughs> and then like she did the worst she did the worst like when he died finally mm-hmm. she did all like the worst things like you know my father was a U.S. marshal he used to wear suits to work every day she buried him in a Washington Redskins uh, jersey oh wow yeah. And like, you know, like it's just crazy, man. I just can't. I just can't was even she, believe was that she people. Always, would... Was she always like that when she was younger? Was she different? Or no, she was always like nope. that. She, she's always been like this. Like you know, me and her haven't really had a good relationship mm-hmm. probably since I was like seventeen years like, old. Did your dad? 16, 17 did your dad? Years old? Did your dad say she was like that when he met her? Or no? Like, did you ever ask him about that? I'm, or no. I'm about to say I never reacted. All that it don't matter to me, you know. I seen yeah. her, I seen her behavior, you know. I seen her behaviors my whole life, you know. Like mm-hmm. all the crazy stuff that the that the women say on your podcast. Oh yeah, you're like mom. when they say they did this to a guy, yeah. you know. Oh, I did that. I, yeah, I seen her do mostly all that stuff. So like it never it never like surprises me at all. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> but yeah, I appreciate it though. Well, thank you for calling in. I'm sorry to hear about your dad. Uh, you should keep the videos up, though. You never know if someone else will see him and they're going through a similar thing. Yeah. All right. Well, appreciate it. Well, thanks for calling in. 
Um, yeah, guys, see the... <sighs> it's usually the mom. It's usually the moms. Um, we have another uh, paid, in, or another, I don't know, is it a super chat or a... Um, welcome, Bob. I don't want to say people's last names in case they want, like, privacy, but I'm just going to say first names. Welcome to the program, Bob. Thank you, you know, for helping us get this stuff out. Um, you can bring up the next. We'll take, like, one or two more calls. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, guys. Um, I, I didn't announce this before. I need to keep doing it. You need your cameras on to come up. I'm not doing trolls. Um, yeah, don't. If you guys are going to... What are the other rules? i got to write them down. Cameras on. Make sure your full face is in it. Um, obviously, he's putting his camera on. But yeah, if you had a similar divorce story, if you're maybe you saw something with your parents, grandparents, friend, you know, whatever, whatever your story is, feel free to call in uh, with family court. Oh, I have another new subscriber. Uh, Andre, unmute. Oh, I think that's your the mic. same one. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Hello. I can't hear you. Are you muted? I think it's muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. What's your name? Andre. Andre, where are you calling from? Calling from California. So what is your story with family court? Well, I'm actually currently uh, going through it right now. I've got uh, three kids. Um, I've been married to my wife for eight years and um they i've just had repeated issues with her going back and forth um constantly constantly withholding the kids at the worst she withheld them for about eight or nine months wow and that was the fourth time she withheld them actually so how old are the uh, kids they are, one's going to be five this year, the other's going to be nine and 11. Okay. And the daughter's the youngest. And so she withheld them four times and the long, longest period was nine <clears throat> months. When, when did that start? That started uh, 2020 or 2021 is the first time she withheld the kids for about a month. Okay. And um, each time, you know, you have to drag them back into court to try to see the kids again. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the judge basically each time was like, you can't do this. And, you know, after the first time she claimed, well, uh, I think there's abuse. And the judge was like, well, did you ever call CPS? And she was like, well, no. And so when they returned the kids to me for visitation and stuff, um, she actually started calling CPS often. And each time they had to tell her, yeah, these are not abuse. You're calling for like, normal childhood injuries basically mm -hmm. she called about six six seven times and it end, they ended up turning it over to juvenile court actually and juvenile court looked at everything and they were like there's no abuse here we're going to kick this back over to family court mm -hmm. so um you know going back and forth with family court and even doing a 730 eval basically each and every one last one of these uh um reports and investigations was in my favor but still there's no there's been no punishment for her i can see my kids now but you know my daughter when she was gone for that longer period of time she returned with a with a bad attitude and that reflects a lot of the statistics with single mother homes you know mm -hmm. when you don't have the father there for stability the children end up you know going down a bad path is so that is I've that been, the oldest one the 11 year old that's the youngest one the youngest. So how old? She's five, you said? She's going to be five next month. Okay. So what was the difference before and after? <clears throat> well, before she was perfectly fine. She didn't, you know, misbehave that much, if at all. You know, she's typical children, you know, mm -hmm. sass when it comes to being a toddler. But uh, afterwards, we had to work on her a lot. Um, just completely misbehaving, not listening to instructions. Um, it's gotten better now because it's been about a year since I've received them back from that eight, nine-month period of time. But uh, 
Yeah, my my oldest is the most stable one. He's a uh, he's pretty good. He's in fact a little bit too tame. About <laughs> <laughs> him. So, how often do you get to see them now? Did you end up getting primary custody? Were you put on child support? Like, what what was the? Are you through with the process? Or are you still in it? No, I'm still in it. Uh, we haven't gone to trial yet, so technically, I'm still married. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm on child support, of course, <laughs> and I'm in California, so. But the 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 crazy thing about all this stuff, though, is um, when it comes to CPS, I actually had a really good experience with them. Uh, you know, most people have horror stories for them, but I was actually surprisingly, um, I was surprised by how well they handled everything because, mm-hmm. the, you know, they caught everything, and including all of her, you know, um, coaching the kids, especially my son and daughter. Uh, but basically how I, how I, um, handle all these things and prove that that I'm not doing anything crazy with the kids is uh, I record every drop up drop off and pick up you know um I have cameras in the house as well so you know they can't say that I'm doing crazy stuff with the kids mm-hmm. and having a daughter is kind of scary in this situation because you know that's when the mothers typically try to say that oh you know he's doing something you know uh unsavory with the daughters and something like that did end up happening, but not with my daughter, with my oldest son. And of course, it was unfounded, so it basically got tossed under the bus. But uh, having having video footage of every drop off and pick up, having cameras in the house, has all helped tremendously. Um, I was able to submit all that evidence to CPS and the 730 eval evaluator and clear my name and a lot of stuff. So. so she tried to put, um, I don't know if I can say it on YouTube, but uh, uh, the pet, like the, she tried to put that accusation on you with your oldest oh, son? Oh, yeah, me, yeah. Uh, both me and my mother. <laughs> wow, she tried to put on your mother. T- I've heard that before. I've heard, there was a case I heard where the they were trying to say the dad did it, like the grandpa. Um, blessing, you might want to fix the camera. I don't know, there you go. Um <clears throat> Wow, but but in your case, they didn't actually go with it. Do you do you think family court is getting better in in your experience, like over time? Well, um, after hearing all the horror stories, um, I came in prepared to get railroaded. But honestly, my experience has not been as bad as other men. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, I still am, you know, downgraded to a visitor to the kids, but. Uh, I haven't received the brunt of of the family court system that other guys have had, but at the same time, they haven't really done much to, you know, punish bad behavior when it comes to my soon-to-be ex. Yeah. And how how often do you get to see them now? I basically get them first, third, and first, third, first, second, first, third, fourth, and fifth weekends. Basically from Friday to Sunday. Okay. And then I also get it overnight during the week. So okay. a little bit better than, you know, some other stories. But I mean, I, I've sunk in thousands of dollars in, you know, lawyers fees. If I didn't have, you know, that kind of help, who's to say what kind of time I would have gotten, you know, with the kids. How much total would you say you've spent on this divorce? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's only been since 2019. And I'd probably say about um, somewhere wow. around 20 grand. 20 grand. Wow. And it's been five years. Yeah. Wow. And you're, it's still not finalized. No, we, we, we filed a petition for, um, for trial, but they kind of ignored it because this was around the time COVID hit and everybody right. got sick of seeing each other. The, you know, the divorces exploded basically in the court system and everybody was just backed up. Does that um, include child support too? the 20 grand or is that just on lawyers? Oh, that's just on lawyer's fees. Okay, so it was 20 and then plus whatever you're paying child support. Yeah. Wow, okay. Well, um, thank you for calling in. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, guys, hold on. Um, okay, one second. You want to bring the next person? We'll do like one or two more. What? Uh, wait, hold on. Let me check the. Wait, give me one second. One second. Um. If you guys have any questions you want me to ask the guys, just let me know. Um. I can see the pain in his eyes. Yeah, yeah. And it's never like these. 
crazy, you know, dead, like, they're always just normal guys. Okay, bring it up. The next one. Hello. Oh, hi there. The kid. Oh, it froze. Again. What's up? <laughs> what? Oh, my bad, man. I didn't know y'all was going to catch that. What's <laughs> no. up, P? Oh, you're so cute. I've been watching you for a long time. You did? <laughs> Yeah, man, I ain't got no horror story because I don't experience that just being honest. I'm a full-time single father out here. You just seen my daughter. She just popped up out of nowhere on the film. But I just came to get the fella some free game. Now, okay. this is how I got full custody of my, my daughter. I can't speak. It's Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, it's 50-50 automatic John split custody. What you do is, if you broke, go get you a PD. If you got a couple dollars, go get you a lawyer. And you tell that lawyer from the rip that you want either 50-50 John split custody or you want full custody. Do not get finessed by these chicks out here, man. Like, I just was reading something that was like, uh... I think it's Wi-Fi. Black. I'm sorry. You know, if you fix your Wi-Fi, you can come back. But, um, well, is there anyone else there or no? Oh, they don't have their mic or their camera. Okay. Is he moving again? He can come back up if he's moving again. It's just frozen. Okay, we'll try it again. No? Okay. Um, well, he sounded like he had something important, but I think he was just saying to not let the chicks finesse you into not going for 50-50 to make sure you go for 50-50. Um, yeah, guys, but Brett... I could I could go through these stories all day. I, I don't make these videos to attack her. I hope she doesn't take it as an attack. I'm a fan of Brett. But what I'm trying to wake up people to what's going on, okay? And, and generally speaking, I, I really, I beg you, if anyone has issues with their father, ask him for his side of the story. Because generally when you hear both sides, the guy's is a lot more sane than the woman's. Um, yeah, so let me know what you guys think in the comments. Um, I don't know, I might do a whole show where we just accept call-ins from um, with guys experience in the court system. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. I, I Let me, I'll tweet. Make sure you guys are going to my X pearly things with a Z. That's where I put the most updates about the show. I've had to be a lot more careful with YouTube. We're trying to get remonetized again, so I just can't post on here as much as I'd like. If you could please go to the audacitynetwork.com. I really want to create a platform where we can just go crazy behind paywalls, where you know all of the people that are just banned on everything have a place. You know, Rumble's great. I like Rumble, but you know, people can still pull clips out of context where if it's behind a paywall you know you can uh, you there's like legal ways where the people can't pull clips if it's behind a paywall like you're not allowed so anyways guys that that's kind of my long term I, I really would just like to have one place where people can freak speak freely and there's no you know controlled opposition no big donors I want it to be funded by the people for the people like the video on your way out, guys. Subscribe to the channel, and I'll talk to you guys next time.